everybody that is inside welcome all members of parliament that are in the in this committee. We want to welcome the minister, the deputy minister, the DG and the DDGs, and also the chairperson of SMO board and all the other people that are inside, including the media. You are all welcome in the meeting. This is an urgent meeting that has been summoned or called by the members of parliament that are in the portfolio committee of public enterprises on issues of ESCOM and the issue around the CEO or the recently appointed CEO, <coughs> uh, Mr. Brian Bonifi, who we knew that he was a member of parliament in the past few weeks, but today he has gone back to ESCOM to become the CEO of ESCOM again. The, the portfolio committee last week seated at in, in a committee meeting, we agreed unanimously, regardless of our affiliations or organizations, we agreed that we must call an immediate meeting, quick meeting with the minister, the board, and the department, so that they explain to the committee what is happening in health in ESCO. Why is Prime Olifi being uh, appointed back to ESCO, what had happened? Why is the post not advertised so that everybody can be able to apply for, 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 for the post? Has Brian Olifi retired? Has Brian Olifi been retrenched? Has Brian Olifi resigned? Or has he stepped down? On those issues, what has happened? in between those issues that are out there in the media. Um, with those few words, I am welcoming everybody in this meeting. Our agenda is in front, I think everybody has got an agenda in front of him or her. The second uh, 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 point or the, 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 the second item in the, in the agenda is the apologies. Do we have any apologies? There are no, no apologies, so all of us an apology of Marshal Tamil. Yes, there's an apology of Marshal Tamil, who is a member of the committee. Honorable Mazar. Chairperson, also an apology from uh, Honorable Eric Murray. Uh, Thanks. Uh, the, the two members of the of the portfolio committees are represented by alternate members from their committees from, I mean from their organizations um, now we will we are on our third item which is the briefing by the Minister of Public Enterprises the, and the board of ESCOM on the decision to reappoint Mr. Brian Mulifi as the group CEO of ESCOM thank you very much I will give over to the Minister Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, members of the committee, members of my department. Oh, good morning, DM. Um, officials, members of the media, South Africans, good morning. Let me start by saying that I've submitted my affidavit to court with regard to the Brian Mulefi matter. Um, You just take the hot coffee away. Sorry, there's just so many things on my thing now. Um, let me start by reporting that I've submitted my affidavit to court with regard to the Brian Molefi matter. I've instructed my legal team to withdraw my opposition to part A of the relief sought, that I set aside my appointment of Mr. Molefi. 
I have nonetheless deposed an affidavit, as I believe the information I have will assist the court in determining its decision. My initial advice was to oppose Part A on the basis that I neither appointed nor in reinstated Mr. Mulefi, as well as on the basis of advice from ESCOM's board that it had obtained an opinion from a senior counsel advocate on its handling of the matter. But having had the opportunity to properly appraise the issues, I have decided that I will buy, abide by the court's decision on the legality of Mr. Mulefi's return to ESCOM. When ESCOM's board approached me to inform me of its decision to bring Mr. Mulefi back, I said I would support it on the proviso that it was legal. I also made this point repeatedly when addressing the media on this matter, though curiously, none of them thought it worthy of reporting. With regard to part B of the motion, which seeks to stop Mr. Mulefi from conducting any work at ESCOM, I have reserved my rights. So there are two, two parts to this. One of the issues that the court will have to decide is a technical one relating to ESCOM's memoranda of incorporation. ESCOM is governed by various pieces of legislation, including the ESCOM Conversion Act of 13, I'm sorry, Act 13 of 2001. Section 6.2 of the Act requires me from time to time to publish memoranda and articles of association. Two different memoranda of incorporation are relevant to Mr. Mulefi's situation. One passed and adopted before his arrival at ESCOM, and one passed um, during his tenure. Material differences between the two documents included that the 2014 version, and I was appointed in May 2014, did not require the minister to be noted as a party to the employment agreement of the group chief executive, um, noting though that the minister was required in, 20, in the 2016 version to be noted in, um, to be noted in, in um, to be noted as a person to be noted. Minister's not very articulate this morning. <laughs> the executive employment contract concluded by Mr. Mulefi and Dr. Ngbani in, Janu in March 2016 was concluded in terms of the 2014 agreement. It, it didn't have to be shown to me at that time. When Mr. Mulefi quit ESCOM in November 2016, I was under the impression that he had resigned. In fact, in lo on 11th of November that year, I wished him well um, and was wa sorry to hear that he has resigned. I was not aware that he had applied for early retirement. This I only learned in April 2017 after reading in the, Malef in the media that Mr. Mulefi was receiving a 30 million rand payout from ESCOM and asking ESCOM's board to make a more prudent deal. Again, on ESCOM's legal argument that Mr. Mulefi was appointed under the terms of the 2014 MOI, the early retirement agreement didn't have to be shown to me. So on the 11th of May 2017, after taking advice from senior counsel, the ESCOM board reverted to me with four options on the proposed 30 million rand payout to Mr. Mulefi. As a courtesy, the board indicated to me its preference was for the consensual decision of Mr. Mulefi's early retirement and that it was willing to accept Mr. Mulefi back as group chief executive. I said I would support the board's decision providing in it was legal. 
As I told the media then, I believe that ESCOM would obtain more value from having Mr. Mulefi at work than simply paying out a 30 million rand. <laughs> Colleagues, I didn't expect that society would universally welcome news of Mr. Mulefi's return to ESCOM following the allegations leveled against him in the public protector's state of capture report. But nor did I anticipate the level of vitriol. I expected that his achievements as a technocrat, the fact that he would, count, would be under enormous scrutiny, and the presumption of innocence until proven guilty would bring some balance to the debate. But there is a presumption of guilt. Despite the public protector's report being taken on review, as a society, as politicians, as media, we must beware of criminalization by association, particularly in the absence of anyone having been convicted of a crime. There is almost a climate of hostility presently surrounding our state-owned companies that incidentally belies their actual performance. It is an environment complicated by strident voices ahead of the ruling party's policy and elective conferences later this year, and by members of the um, opposition who view the state of capture report as their tickets to Nirvana. I'm not telling you this to try and make you feel sympathetic towards Brian Mulefi, Dr. Ngubani, or ESCOM, but because I feel it's the truth. Dr. Ngubani is here. He will be able to answer whatever operational and technical questions you might have. Um, I also see that Dr. Pat is here, and I see that Mr. Koza is here. They are board members. Um, Dr. Pat Naidu, sorry, I couldn't remember your surname. Let me say in your and Dr. Ngubani's presence that I have noted concerns that have been raised about the board's performance to the extent that some have called for its dissolution. I don't think it would be fair to jump to any conclusions while, there is an important, while this matter is before the court. I have, however, because ESCOM has an AGM, um, at the beginning of July, end of June 2017, I've already started a process where they have an external evaluator, um, which, they, which happens annually because boards are appointed for three years and then they can be rotated annually um, depending on their performance. And if a, um, I have, I ever taken that legal advice on the process to follow, um, if it's appropriate, while a discussion is underway in government at the moment as well. Madam Chairperson, our giant state-owned companies, including ESCOM, are critical levers of the developmental transformative state. Where they are, we must fix them. But we must be very careful we don't allow our discourse to break them. Later this week, when Deputy Minister Martins and I present the department's budget vote, we will provide a progress report on the state-owned company's reform project and development of shareholder policy. Suffice to say now that the project will directly address some of the governance issues we are here to discuss today, including the appointment of chief executive officers and the creation of remuneration and pension standards. I thank you for the time you've given me. I will try my best to answer the questions you may have and Dr. Ben Gubani will do the same. Thank you. So I will take I will take uh, the questions from the members of parliament that are here. Can I propose that the uh, the chairperson of the scom board speaks? Yes. Yeah. Can the chairperson of the scom board speaks and then? Uh,
who can then, so that he can, must, can then ask questions on the basis. That, that is why, uh, Honorable Shivambo, I asked, is there anyone that wants to say something? And nobody responded. But if the meeting or the members of parliament feels that the, 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 the chairperson of the board has to say something, the chairperson of the board, I am giving over to you to say something or to, 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 to speak, uh, adding or subtracting from what the minister has said. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, honorable members of parliament, our minister and shareholder, Minister Brown, and the deputy minister, Mr. Martins, DG, and board members of ESCOM, ladies and gentlemen. I think the minister has said almost everything pertaining to the processes that occurred, resulting in the present situation. I was with council yesterday, and they told me that they've filed the affidavit that I signed, and that this matter cannot be debated anywhere else other than in a court of law. This was the council opinion. So I, in all fairness, I have to listen to council because they're representing us in court and they will be raising the arguments and answering allegations. So I'm, my hands are tight in terms of how far I can go. But the processes that the minister outlined are exactly what happened. Thank you very much, House Chairperson, uh, Chairperson of the Committee. Um, just to point out that we've received legal advice um, in terms of Parliament's own procedures around the subjudicate rule, and unfortunately it's not going to today be the convenient shield that's expected to be to shield Eskom and the Chairperson of the Board from answering uh, their a responsibility in terms of the Constitution to account to this body and to this Parliament. It is your duty, sir, to account and give a full account to this body. In respect to what's going on in the court, the subjudicate rule since the MIDI television case is regarded as archaic and not applicable. You are accountable, sir, to us as members of Parliament elected to hold you accountable and the Minister accountable. And um, I would submit, Madam Chairperson, that the subjudicate rule does not apply and should not be used as an excuse to not give a full and proper account to this body and the people of South Africa for the shenanigans at ESCA. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable uh, Senator. The legal opinion from Parliament has been circulated. I think the members should take a look at it if, 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 if you, <coughs> you, you want to say something. Honourable uh, Riyadh. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chairperson. My chair is to maybe get closer to what the latter speaker has said as it relates to the subject nature of this exercise. But let me put it categorically clear, Jack, that in the same in the same legal advice that we received as, 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 as the committee. On top of what the honorable member has said, the honorable state he goes further to say the, as long as the exercise is not going to get deeper into the demerits of, 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 of the case, we have a right or we have a responsibility uh, to to hold the executive and the board individually and collectively. So we can't suspend our role as a committee to get information about this, but safe to indicate that we don't either want 
to get into the case, into the merits of this case. Of, of, of the case uh, thank you. That's fine, uh, Chair. The, the chairperson doesn't want to speak, so it's fine, but we're going to ask questions to the minister. Uh, so on the... Yeah, I, I, I think that, 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 that is solved. Like, no, there's an other hand. Okay, that's fine, yeah. I don't think that there's any contention around that, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, Chairperson, I think my colleagues are quite right. We received an opinion from the Chief Legal Advisor to Parliament, and uh, as much as the Ministry and the Board has the benefit of legal advisors, I think it would be appropriate for us as a committee that represents Parliament also to have our legal advisors present in this meeting, because if they are not here, it's, uh, you know, it's not going to take them long to get here. So that if we are steering off course, or, or we are being advised that we are steering off course, then we could get uh, the considered advice of Parliament's legal advisors. But ha having said that, Chairperson, the Minister has given us a report. But personally, I'm nowhere near knowing what happened. Nowhere near, uh, near knowing what happened. And, and I would like that uh, she provides us with the document she referred to. We don't have the benefit of that affidavit that she submitted to court, and I believe it's public information. And, you know, we can then refer to a document that you've referred to, which will assist the process. But for now, I think we should proceed, and uh, if the chairperson of the board does not want to make any remarks, I mean, we will still continue to ask questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I think we should continue asking questions, but I see the head of the deputy minister is up. Maybe he wants to say something. Chair, I think the most propitious thing to do under the present circumstances is to take cognizance of uh, what the minister said and in his rejoinder, the chairperson also said that he concurs with the articulation of the events that she presented to the House. So in order to move forward, the first quarter committee is within its right to ask questions in regard to what the minister has articulated here this morning. And by taking questions for that contribution, it will shed light where the chairperson of uh, ESCO has to provide the committee with the requested information, it would be proper that we ask the information so that we see how far we can go. And if we so, where activators have been put in force, they would have to articulate the nature of those elevators and then the portal would be we have an understanding. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Minister Brown, Deputy Minister. Minister Brown, last week when uh, the, uh, we heard of the reappointment of uh, Mr. Malefi, we also heard that you've been summoned back to Latuli House uh, by the ANC for a discussion on this issue. I wonder if you'd share with this committee uh, by whom you were summoned and why, and uh, as a result of that meeting, uh, where you currently stand, and is that why you are withdrawing your opposition to Section A? of uh, the DA's court papers. 
Chairperson, the Democratic Alliance has consistently asked for the employment contract of Mr. Brian Malefi, both uh, the, his former contract as well as his uh, contract now, to be made public, and I'd like the Minister to make a, a public declaration that she will allow us to see that document. Chair, I must say that um, this, this whole situation has gone from the sublime to the ridiculous. And I think for the Minister and Dr Ngobani to expect the South African public to just sit back and accept what's been brought before us today is, is simply unacceptable. And it, it really is a slap in the face of, of good governance. And I use that term good governance because that is exactly what Mr Malefi said his reason for resigning was. And I have in front of me uh, Mr Malefi's resignation document. I also have an uh, internal memorandum which was sent to ESCOM to 48,000 ESCOM employees from the head of HR informing them that Mr. Malefi had in fact resigned. And uh, I also have WhatsApp correspondence where some of the power station managers even aired their discontent with the fact that Mr. Malefi had resigned and he answers them by saying my decision is final. So I find it very uh, confusing, as I think do all South Africans, to now have to accept and to read that one minute it was a retrenchment, one minute it was an early retirement, now it was a, a resignation, it's now known as the triple R. And I think that it, it's unacceptable that, that we as members of parliament are, are, are treated in, in such a fashion that we're accepted, expected to believe this kind of thing. And I think we now run the risk of the, of the name Malefi going from a noun to a verb and I think we're going to be telling our children to stop telling Malefis because certainly we cannot be expected to believe anything that's in front of us now because it, it's just, it's, it, it can't be. Chair, I, I find it very difficult to believe that Minister Brown as the stakeholder and as the chief overseer of ESCOM would not have known that Mr Malefi applied for early retirement. I, I think that there has to be some kind of relationship between Minister Brown and Minister Ngobani, uh, Dr Ngobani rather, um, and, and I fail to understand and fail to believe that Minister Brown was, did not know that uh, Mr Malefi took uh, early retirement, if that's in fact what he did. I, I believe her when she says that she understood that he resigned because the entire country understood that he resigned. And that's why he was sworn in as a Member of Parliament. Certainly you cannot be sworn in as a member of parliament if you're still a CEO and simply on unpaid leave. These things do not make sense and as South Africans we have every right to be furious that we find ourselves in this situation. Chair, 30 million rand, that is a lot of money to be paid out to anyone. In fact, Minister, I'd go so far as to say it's an obscene amount of money. 7.7 .7 million rand a year salary is an obscene salary to be paid. Can the minister tell us how much of this 30 million rand has been paid to Mr. Malefi? And will the minister provide the documents detailing the payments of this 30 million rand, how it was brought about, how it was calculated? Because we have certainly dealt with actuaries who have done their own assessment of how much should have been paid. And given the 18 months employment at ESCOM, even taking into account Minister Malefi, um, um, oh, that's a Freudian slip, Mr. Malefi's uh, previous, <laughs> you were supposed to be the minister, yeah. Given uh, uh, Mr. Malefi's previous employment, it should have been around uh, 2.8 million. So I'd love to know where the 30 million uh, amount comes. And then, Shia, I'd like the minister to be perfectly frank and honest with the South African public. Do you think it's right and fair for a South African, a fellow South African, someone who's supposedly someone we should look up to according to you, who has a, a good track record according to Minister Brown, to in fact hold the entire country to ransom for 30 million rand. Because if we are to believe the Minister's story, it is her assumption and her understanding of the matter that it was better to re-employ Mr Malefi than to pay out a 30 million rand, uh, which is what the board decided on. So in my mind that means a South African is holding the entire nation to ransom for a sum of 30 million rand. And I'm confused and I'm surprised that Minister Brown would allow herself to be bullied into, into that kind of situation and find herself in such a compromising situation. Chair, I think it's, it's self-evident. The left tongue doesn't know what the lung, right tongue is lying about. Someone is telling a fib, Minister. And it's up to you today to clear your name in this committee. And you have to tell us the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because you have now signed a court document 
you are now appearing in front of Parliament, in front of a parliamentary committee, and you are obliged to tell us the truth. And anything that is not the truth coming from you will hold you ethically liable in Parliament and criminally liable in court. So, Minister, come clean with us. Tell us who's lying. This is your opportunity, and, and we expect, Minister, for you today to tell us what the real situation is. Because as it carries on now, we're a laughing stock. People are rightly laughing at us, and it simply cannot, cannot go on as, as, as such. Minister Brown, lastly, and perhaps Mr. Ben, Dr. Ngobani would like to answer this. I have in front of me the advert, the advert that ESCOM released for the position of CEO. If in fact Minister Malefi was on unpaid leave and was CEO all the time, why was this position advertised? And I also have people who have been, uh, who have been interviewed for the job who have spoken to me, told me about their interviews, and are willing to file affidavits to say they were interviewed for the position of CEO. So why, if Mr. Malefi, according to Dr. Ngobani, was simply on leave, why was this position advertised and why did you take interviews? Thank you very much. Uh, just, just a correction. It's not Minister Malefi, uh, it's Minister Malefi. Yes. I, 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 I realize the, the oh, error and I'm, I'm very grateful that it's not Minister, uh, believe honor, me. Honor, honor Thank you, thank you, Chair, once more. Okay. Uh, Chairperson, I think we have arrived now at a time when what South Africans have been waiting for since the news of the return of uh, Mr. Brown Mulefe to the organization that is ESCO. I want to pose a question uh, first to the Honorable Minister Chairperson, the Minister, the, the Minister as the leader of the shareholder of ESCO, and also recognizing the experience and expertise that exist in the individual, that is Mr. Mulife. On receipt of the news that uh, Mr. Mulife was contemplating to leave or was to leave the organization. What did the minister did in order to ensure that the investment of ESCOM in the expertise of Mr. Mulife are sustained or maintained in the organization? I'm referring to the time when he was to resign and uh, join Parliament. And secondly, Chair, the early retirement issue of, of Mr. Mulife, when did the Minister get the information as it pertains to the application for early retirement on part of Mr. Mulife? And in receipt of that, what did the Minister do in collaboration maybe with the chairperson of the board because I firmly believe that the board has a responsibility to conduct oversight over ESCOM and is a governance structure. It can be correct for the board to say today I receive the letter of either stepping down retirement, early retirement or, or resignation and then you regard that as a, a normal issue especially when an accounting officer is actually taking that course. What is it that the board did in particular the chairperson in collaboration with the minister, the, the political head of the department and secondly on a Honourable Minister, on the promotion of sound administration in the organization, do you think what has happened in ESCOM for such a senior individual and an important warm body in that organization is today going to Parliament, then the following day is coming back 
and all of a sudden you declare honorable minister that you were not aware of the application as it pertains to Mr. Mulife. Uh, the state-owned enterprises uh, honorable chairperson salaries has been a thorn in the flesh of all of us. And now we are in this quagmire and we must not be surprised when one is living wrongly or rightfully and then there is a huge of money that must be paid. And when we were querying this as members of parliament to say there must be a certain consideration or reviewal of this, are we correct to have warm bodies that are earning triple what the president is, is, is earning? So it was regarded as if no, it is normal. These state-owned uh, enterprises are different bodies that are governed out of the uh, public finance management. Now we are in this quagmire. What then is the view of the minister to generally look into this aspect? Because uh, an incident of this nature is new to my own knowledge. But if the Honorable Minister and the Board have actually experienced this, how did they apply their minds in resolving such uh, an aspect which is actually now in the courts of laws? And when we have the body, the, the ministry, as well as, as the board, whose responsibility individually and collectively need to make sure that whatever action, conduct and behavior of the accounting officer is also their responsibility as well. And we can't now behave as if one or one thing has gone wrong here. All has gone wrong. The organization, ESCOM, is in Tatas like now and the credibility is at stake and the work of the board has been tarnished and the integrity of the board members individually and collectively is now challenged. How do we then, Honorable Minister, deal with this issue in a manner that is fair and square? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable, Honorable Kungubel. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. I think a set of questions have been asked, which is going to create a stronger platform for further engagement. Because I think, Minister, and both yourself and the Chair of the Board, we know how essential is the credibility of ESCO? How essential does the general government contribute to that credibility? How economically it affects the country as we speak your current young status and so on? And we know that there is a question mark around Brian. That question mark has not been cleared. It's a matter of fact. We work on the belief that you decide, Chair of the Board, to work on the belief that that question mark might go. But the question mark exists. It is no excuse to say there is an application by the President for, for review. That doesn't change the question mark. Because as we say, as we speak now, the public protector has got a view on Brian. What the president is doing is applying to court for reviewal of a view. And that view creates a question mark that has not been cleared. My curiosity is what put you, what pressurized you for such a for such a strategic institution to hire somebody on whose head there's a question mark that has not been cleared. 
or pressurize you to do that? What forces you to do that? You've been a chair of boards. You've been a leader in government. You've got a track record. I guess the, the government's principles must be flowing in your system. How do you hire somebody to lead an institution with this question mark that has not been cleared? What is your attitude to the credibility of this country as affected by the decision you have taken? Now, I agree with the statement that says the basis of employment of Brian Mulefe is something that must be presented. It must be exposed. It must be understood. Because it is on that basis that you are arguing on your correctness to, to rehire. And that decision is a public question. It's in the public interest. And based on that, the information around that is necessary. Even, even actually putting in place for everybody to see the, the memorandum of incorporation. I'm also curious, Minister, around the statement you are making that says you had an impression that Brian had resigned. I, I, would, I would strongly request that the Minister clarifies how, it, how does it happen when, the, when that political office is an oversight office, when such a strategic person leaves, how do we deal with such a person on an impression? There is also this statement that says an agreement between the board and Brian around the 30 million. The question I would want to pose was a due, due diligence done to check the legality of that agreement? And can we be presented with that agreement of the 30 million? And I think we must also be clarified to what extent are the powers of the Minister of Oversight irrelevant when the board acts apparently illegally? But I think a lot of questions have been asked. I'm curious to hear how the answers are going to be with regard to that. Thank you, Honorable Shivambo. I have got a list of honorable members. You, I, I, I have listed your names here, so I am following the list. My apologies if there is something that is making you to want to ask now, but I've got a, a list that I'm following. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. I think it's important that perhaps before we make uh, substantial remarks, we point to the fact that the powers, privileges and immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislators Act says that uh, there are offences that relate to witnesses, to people who are called here to Parliament to account on certain issues. And Section 17.2 of that act says that a person whether or not during examination under section 15 willfully furnishes a house or committee with information or makes a statement before it which is false or misleading commits an offense and is liable to a fine or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding two years or to both the fine and imprisonment I think that we must clarify that, that if people are going to come here and lie to us and give us misleading information, we're going to report them to the police and they must be arrested. And if the police do not do that, we're going to take it on court until there's been action because there's been a character of lawlessness that uh, has been happening. People undermine parliament and that must come to an end. I can tell you it's going to come to an end uh, moving forward. Let's just take the minister through what has happened thus far. On the 14th of October, the public protector released the state of capture report. And then on the 11th of November, Brian Mulefe resigned, citing the state of capture report as the reasons why he's resigning as a chief executive officer of ESCOM. And he did not say that he's going to subject 
the state of capture report for judicial review. On the 11th of November, the minister accepted the resignation of Brian Wilf and says that the public enterprise minister in Brown notes a resignation of Brian Wilf. That was the heading. And the ESCOM board did not say anything about that. They did not say that, oh, minister, you have issued a statement about the resignation of Brian Wilf. He actually did not resign. They never said that anything about that. And then on the 30th of November, the minister approved the acting CEO, Matsela Kuku, and then again reaffirmed that this is due to the resignation. That is your own words of Brian Wilf. Again, the board did not clarify that Brian Wilf has not resigned, he has retired. Uh, and then in the beginning of around March, the board of ESCOM advertised for the position of chief executive officer of ESCOM with the closing date of the 20th of March 2017. And the reason why the board of ESCOM advertised for the chief executive position is because there was a vacancy in that office. And that vacancy was created by Brian Miller, who we had resigned and was sworn in as a member of parliament. And the member of parliament, when you are sworn so in, in, it says in section 47 that a member of parliament can be any person who is eligible to vote for the assembly, but that person must not be in the employ of the state or state organs. So I think that it's, it's, it's clear that it's beyond any reasonable doubt that Brian Mulefe had resigned. So no one must try to mislead the parliament here. It's a criminal offense in terms of that act that we quoted here. Yeah. So no one must try to mislead the parliament. And Brian Minifer is not appealing the state of capture report. The president is. And the president is appealing the remedial action and not the findings. He's is appealing the things that relate to him. There are findings in the state of capture report that the, the proximity between the Guptas and Brian Malifi were uncomfortable for the days that later on related to together getting money from ESCOM. 44 calls made between Atul Gupta and uh, Brian Malifi and uh, IJ Gupta and all sorts of Guptas making calls in between themselves and a CE of a state-owned company which later on grants the family a substantial contracts, the lucrative contracts that pays billions of friends. That is not under judicial review. In any way, even if the president were to go to judicial review, we can't go there and say that I dispute that there were phone calls between Brian Malifi and Atul Gupta. How does he know? He's not appealing that. And in terms of the Paja Act, uh, I think that you are running out of time. I don't think that there is even a time for you to could even appeal that is ESCOM or Brian Mulefe. So there is no... So you must not take us for a right. At least respect Parliament. If you wanted to employ Brian Mulefe, why didn't you advise him to apply for the job when the rest of the people appointed, uh, applied? The Arnold Matsela Kuku applied for the job. He said he went to interviews. I spoke to him that there were interviews conducted for the appointment of a ESCOM CEO. Why? Because there was a vacancy that had been created by a resignation of Brian Willey for who has been a member of parliament and could therefore not be in the employ of the state. So I, I, I think that we must stop the games, Chairperson of the House, and not uh, listen to what I think is a nonsensical explanation by the minister. It must be rejected outrightly. And, 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 and we must give a directive that the ESCOM board should be subjected to an inquiry uh, to check if it's suitable to continue as a board of ESCOM. I don't think that they are exercising their fiduciary responsibilities in a responsible way, particularly that uh, They've appointed a person who is not reviewing the fact that 
he had a compromising relationship with the family that ultimately got contracts from ESCOM. And then they appoint that person to continue as a chief executive of the a, a, of ESCOM of the of the state company. So I, I, that only is adequate to take action against the board. I think that we must subject it to an inquiry, a thorough inquiry that is going to expose uh, not only the issue of the appointment but some of the issues that have been identified in the state of capture report which they've not appealed, which primarily has not appealed so that we can uh, uh, reach a determination in terms of uh, what should happen. We must not be taken for granted. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Shivambo. I think that must get to the recommendation. It's Honorable Stianese and before you, Honorable Tzedi. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairperson. Thank you to the Minister for her input this morning. Chairperson, I smell a rat. And let me tell you why I smell a rat. Because when you look at somebody's behavior, and then suddenly that behavior jumps into an outlier position, it should be a warning sign for all of us. Now, I know Minister Brown to be a good minister. I know her to be a minister who's always been upfront and honest uh, in her dealings and her duties. And I know her to have uh, exercised only the best fiduciary duty over those entities for which she has uh, had control. And so I find her behavior in this instance a complete outlier to the Minister Lynn Brown that I've witnessed and worked with over the last three or four years. And that makes me very suspicious. Makes me very suspicious indeed. Let's, as the Honorable Shimambo said, dispense with the nonsense. Brian Malefe was not on maternity leave. He was not on resignation. He was not on uh, long leave. He had not temporarily taken leave, unpaid leave. Brian Malefe had resigned from Eskom. Even if Brian Malefe had not furnished you, Minister, and others with a resignation letter, even if he had not made the public pronouncements that he had resigned, when Brian Malefe raised his right hand in the Speaker's parlour in the building across the road and swore to uphold and defend the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa as a Member of Parliament, he tacitly resigned from Eskom. Because the Constitution is very clear at Section 47. It says that Every citizen who is qualified to vote for the National Assembly is eligible to be a member of the Assembly except A, anyone who is appointed by or is in the service of the state and receives remuneration for that appointment or service. Mr. Malefe, therefore, as either, I, I would suggest to you that he tacitly resigned, even if he hadn't furnished you and the board with a formal resignation letter by being sworn in and accepting that oath of office, or he has perjured himself by swearing a, a solemn oath before a presiding officer of the Republic of South Africa to uphold the very constitution which he then would have known at the back of his mind he was betraying because he would be in breach of section 47. So either way, on either version, Mr. Malefe is shown to not be an honorable man. Either way. So let's just dispense with that nonsense. Mr. Malefe had resigned from Eskom. That is why Eskom went ahead and advertised the position and started procedures to fill it. So let's all just be at Edom on that. Stop this ridiculous public discourse about where he was and what he was doing. We know where he was. I would say to you, Minister, as well, that it's in fact, it's not the public disclosure that's destroying Eskom. It is the weekly bleeding and exposure of the wrongdoing that's been going on in Eskom under this board's nose, either with their knowledge or without their knowledge, which we're seeing dragged out every week in the newspapers and on Sunday television programs where very serious questions have been asked of Mr. Coco and other members relating to um, coal contracts which appear to have been steered towards Gupta owned mines, to advances that Mr. Coco denied were given and then when they were pushed under his nose, under his own signature, then you know, it couldn't explain it. We are seeing now this uh, in and out of Mr. Brian Malefe it's not the public disclosure that's destroying Eskom. It's the behavior of those people within Eskom who fall under your charge and duty, Madam Minister, uh, who are destroying Eskom. And I find it very interesting you'll use the word that the opposition see this as a nirvana. 
Now, if you know what the meaning of the word nirvana, it means blown out. And you're right, I'm seeing Eskim being blown out in front of our eyes. And I don't see enough fiduciary responsibility, I don't see enough commitment from your side, Minister, and from the board side to reverse this trend. I, what I do see, what I do see is the outlier behavior continuing. Why on earth, and you say Mr. Malefe has not been found guilty by the public protector's report. Well, he hasn't cleared his name yet either. We still have no explanation about the, the calls between him and Atul Gupta. He hasn't explained it. We've got no explanation about the clear steering of business towards Gupta-owned companies. No explanation whatsoever. We don't even know where the Saxon Wall Shabin is at this stage. He has not come clean and cleared his name as he said he wanted to do. We are no wiser today about those facts and his involvement therein than we were when the allegations were made and the report first came out. So I think given those circumstances, the board has itself behaved reckless, recklessly by appointing him as the, CEO, as the CEO again, given the fact that he still faces these huge allegations and clouds. Why on earth would you appoint somebody to head a board of a parastatal who on your own version of offense has lied to parliament and perjured himself by taking an oath of office which he knew was not, not truthful? Why would you appoint somebody with these huge allegations hanging over their heads where in as you, on your own version there have been inconclusive um, uh, uh, findings on it and, and he certainly has not been cleared. And so the reverse also applies, Minister. And I believe that in this instance the board have behaved recklessly and have not at the best interests of state money and the taxpayers of South Africa and not done their fiduciary duty uh, to the level that it should be done. And so, Madam, uh, Madam Minister, I would say to you, because it's such outlier behavior, the question I want to ask you, because it's just not the Minister Lynn Brown I know, did President Jacob Zuma have a conversation with you and instruct you to reinstate Mr. Malefe at Eskom? Did you discuss this matter at any stage with the President? And what was his instruction to you, if any, in relation to Mr. Malefe? Chairperson, I'd also like to make some recommendations uh, around a full parliamentary inquiry, um, because I think that Eskom needs the same treatment that the SABC has got. It's been a very, very good process for the SABC. I think they're back on track now and starting to see the green shoots of recovery there. I think that this board needs the same TCP treatment from Parliament to start disinfecting it and getting it back on track. Thank you, Honourable Tzedi. Thanks very much, uh, Chair President. Uh, I, I, I need to be clarified on some few issues here. And, and, and some of the issues that are going to be raising we need the chairperson on the board to, to come in at some stage. And I want to disregard what you said earlier. Because the, the, the fact that we had to convene this extraordinary session of the portfolio committee suggests that we are dealing with a matter which is of public interest. So, so, so I'm disregarding what you said earlier with regard to that rule on the basis of our understanding of the rule. Maybe let me start with that one. Two meetings, Chairperson, that I want you to, to clarify of the to clarify of the board. One meeting that took place sometime last year at the time Mr. Mulifer was to leave ESCOM. At that particular moment, what is it that you accepted in that particular meeting? Resignation, early retirement, or whatever. So it would be important for us to be clarified at this particular stage. What is it that you were accepting? Surely you were accepting something in your records. What is it that you accepted? from Brian Mulif at that particular stage. The second one relates to the meeting that you had of rescinding a decision that led to the reinstatement of Mr. Brian Mulif. 
and I will need clarity on that particular issues. Surely there are some issues that you have agreed upon in that particular meeting. Even the record says there are some monies that need to be paid back. Can you clarify us on that particular uh, aspect? And I want to go back to, to what Honorable Gungulele uh, indicated in relation to the presentation by the minister. Because he needed to be clarified on your impression, which says you are under the impression that he has resigned or he has taken a little time or whatever. And I want to take it further. From where we are, what would you say are the areas that were not properly processed by the board in relation to this very crucial matter? And I want to ask a direct question linked to this one. On the basis of the explanation that we are going to be getting, of course, having consulted your legal section, whether we have a winnable case. On the basis of the explanation that you will give us, it will be very difficult for us not to be convinced that if we end up losing this particular case, we will have to, we will have to convince us why we can't take the route we says whoever has pursued this particular matter must then be responsible for the cost. So, so, so I'm saying a direct question, a, a Honorable Minister. Can you tell this portfolio committee, do we have a winnable case to pursue this particular matter? <laughs> the, the, the second last point, uh, The, the, from the, uh, the affidavits that uh, have been filed, well, have been filed, there is an indication which says Mr. Brian Milita was on a paid leave while he was an MP. Maybe this one also relates to uh, what the board, the board will have to clarify. He may have been on a paid leave while he was an MP. Can you clarify this particular uh, aspect? So that as we live here, we know exactly uh, what we are dealing with. As I've indicated, we've got a responsibility as the portfolio committee to conduct oversight over the board. I've disregarded what you said earlier. It will be important for us to be clarified on this particular aspect. Hence, we have convened this session so that as we live here, we know what is it that we can tell South Africans about this issue that has brought us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sidi. Honorable uh, Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I'm not going to repeat any of the questions that were asked, save to emphasize some of them, uh, because I think we need answers now. We need more answers than questions. Uh, but, but having said that, uh, Chairperson, I'm glad that uh, you've requested the parliamentary legal advisors to be here. I understand that they have arrived because that will help us as, as, as we move forward. But Chairperson, I want to start off by saying that, you know, this whole issue goes beyond a matter of a court case, beyond Mr. Molefe, uh, beyond ESCOM, but it's at the heart of it is good governance and whether or not we want good governance in our country. That's what it is all about. But in saying that, there are so many, Minister, I said uh, through you, Chair, I said earlier on, I'm in a no way clearer with the report of the Minister than I was before I got here. Because there are so many unanswered questions, simple questions. Did Mr. Mulefe resign? Was he on unpaid leave? Who accepted his resignation? Is the HR person that accepted his resignation here? Why did you advertise for a CEO if he had already resigned? Those questions have been asked. And another investigation we need, Honorable Chairperson, did Mr. Molefe commit to perjury when he lifted his hand and was sworn in as a member of parliament? And was his political party 
implicit in this. Were they aware that he had uh, not resigned from ESCOM and he was receiving uh, some benefit from another state open? So these are things that we need to investigate. But having said that, uh, Honorable Chairperson, through you, the Honorable Minister in the beginning said, and we heard on, on, on previous uh, statements that she's issued, that, you know, Mr. Malefe is innocent until proven guilty. And we accept that as a norm in, in our society in South Africa. person is innocent until proven guilty. But the point is there is no process to test whether Mr. Molefi was involved in any uh, shenanigans while he was at ESCOM. The State of Capture report, as Honorable Shivambu uh, mentioned, did indicate that there, were, there was prima facie evidence of wrongdoings between Ope and Tegeta. And this also goes to the heart of people who are using SOEs as a cash cow and as their personal ATMs. They can just go and withdraw money from SOEs whenever they want to. This is what's happening in our country. And taxpayers are losing out in the process. The president still has not presented a case before the public protector on whether or not he's contesting and in what way he's contesting the recommendations of the state capture report. In a pointed question to the honorable president in parliament during question time, I indicated to him that there was prima facie evidence of wrongdoings within ESCO. Will he not appoint a commission of inquiry to investigate what happened in ESCO alone? His answer was no. Subsequently, the Honorable Minister, with whom I have a long relationship as well, and Minister, you need to tell us, Minister, you know, it's, it's your credibility on the stick through your chair. Is there any influence from anybody else in this matter that's clouding your judgment? I know you too long. We worked as MECs together. I know you too long for you not to make the kind of quote-unquote mistakes that you are making now. So come clean with South Africa. I think your credibility is at stake. The Honorable Minister has rightly called for a committee of inquiry in the press statement. The media know about it. Again last week in Parliament she said to me, well, you know, I've asked for this committee of inquiry, it's not for me to appoint it. And you're right, a judicial committee of inquiry is appointed by the President. But Minister, you have the oversight responsibility through your chair to appoint any kind of inquiry into a state-owned enterprise for which you are responsible. We are now going to take over that responsibility as a committee because Honorable Steen and was not in our committee last week, when we decided as a committee collectively <laughs> that if we do not get an ad hoc committee of inquiry, we'll, rule, we'll use Rule 167, which empowers us as a committee to call anybody, summon anybody before us, and have a week-long, two-week-long inquiry into what is happening at ESCOM, including what has happened with Mr. Brian Malefi. And all we need is resources from Parliament, adequate resources, both financial and human. And we're going to do that, uh, Honorable Chair, because you agree, we all agree that we are going to do that. So, Honorable Chair, through you, Honorable Minister, please, tell South Africa what is going wrong here. Are you being unduly influenced by anybody to make these kinds of statements that you've made? Resigned, unpaid leave, did not resign, 30 million, etc., etc. And I think it will help you, it will help all of us if we can get those answers. I'm very glad, <coughs> lastly, finally, Honorable Chairperson, that the former Minister of Finance is here with us uh, in this meeting as a member of this committee. I think we were told that he is a member of this committee, and I think maybe you didn't see him sitting in the corner to have welcomed him, because we welcome all new members to this committee. He will be aware of the spats between Treasury and some of the state-owned enterprises, and where there was reluctance to provide answers. So this goes beyond Mr. Molefe and things like that. Good governance is at the heart. We want answers, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Singh. Before I call Honorable Amanda, <coughs> let me do the formal thing in, 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 in welcoming Honorable Bungu Bele in the committee and Honorable uh, Gordon as our new members. 
in the community, then this community is full of maids, but we will, we will look at that. Thank you, Chen. I think um, as members, we, we, we agree on the questions raised regarding Mr. Mulefe. And my choice on, on, on him. The statement Mr. Molefe wrote or presented on the 11th of November 2016. In his statement, um, he, what's the word? he repeatedly said he's stepping down in the interest of good corporate governance. And then he said he's going to take steps into finding out King clearing his name. Now I want to ask the, uh, the minister if Mr. Molefe's return, according to her, is it part of good governance? Him returning, is he now cleared and all that? Question number two is with the department and, and ESCOM, that who is reporting to who? Is the minister reporting to ESCOM or ESCOM reporting to the minister? If the minister can find out serious issues on the media, like the 30 million in April, <coughs> was ESCOM not supposed to have informed the minister or called a meeting or whatever, informed the minister of the things that were happening? Why is she only finding out when they have they are giving Mr. Molife 30 million and she comes in to stop the 30 million and later they reinstate Mr. Molife. Number three, this unpaid leave. I think here somebody is, you know, some other time I said I don't believe what somebody was representing. And they said I said people are lying. So I'm, I'm going to try not to repeat that word. But somewhere, somehow, Chair, somebody is not giving us the correct version of events. <clears throat> if you are on unpaid leave, then you are still a member or an employee of ESCO. If you are on early retirement, it means you are no longer working there you have retired, you are leaving the premises and everything. If you are resigning, you are, you are given part of your pensions because you are working there. They give you part of your, your, your pensions and you go home either to start work somewhere else or to just stay at home and enjoy your, your packages. But with Mr. Molife, today we are stepping down after an hour, we are resigning, we are early retirement, unpaid leave, um, maternity leave, they're here, there's a maternity leave now. There's, uh, what's that other one where he, no, he stepped down, he retrenched. All, all of these terms, I think someone, somebody is playing with our minds. So if the department and ESCOM can be honest with us and, and tell us the truth, because the only way we are going to get ESCOM right is if we are honest, if we tell the truth, if we tell the people the truth. That is all that they want. I don't think all this noise that is going around is it's, it's on anything but the truth. If we are saying he stepped down, let it be that he stepped down and, 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 and <coughs> clarify us on this stepping down and resignation. If somebody steps down, what does that mean according to a score? Because from my understanding, if you step down, you are resigning. So you must just go home. And Mr. Malefe had written a statement where he stepped down. The minister accepts the, the statement as Mr. Malefe is resigning, as resignation. 
So what is actually happening here? And, and, and my last question, Minister, is, is it not, would it not have been proper not to accept uh, Mr. Manifest's reinstatement, <coughs> seeing that there are all these misunderstandings of whether he resigned or whatever? I think it was correct that you stopped the 30 million payout to him. But at the end of the day, he was reinstated. Was it not proper to say, because of that 30 million, there's now that thing of the 30 million, you stopped it, it is good. Now he's being reappointed and he was a member of parliament. He left here on a Thursday after a city. On Monday, his papa action coming back to work. <laughs> so somewhere, somewhere there, shouldn't the minister have said, as a shareholder, was it not, wouldn't it have been proper for you to say no? We are not going to accept this man until we have cleared everything or done things in a, in a proper manner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Nobanda. We'll now move to Honorable Gorda. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to make a maiden speech, uh, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and as several members have pointed out, uh, the questions are plenty, the answers are all over the show, they lack credibility, both in the public domain and from what I'm hearing uh, here as well. So let me also apologize for, for, for being late. Um, I think context matters here, Chairperson. And the context is firstly, I don't know whether the board lives in its own oblivion, but the public is connecting the dots, members of the board. Increasingly, the public is aware of what you as the board of Eskom are doing and not doing. They are increasingly aware that you are abusing state property and state resources in the name of yourselves, not in the name of the South African public. That you are part of either wittingly or unwittingly, in some cases I think there's enough evidence to say wittingly, a conspiracy to capture Eskom for the purposes of the benefit of a few. That's, that's the reality. Let's not uh, play around with sort of technical questions. That's the reality. And Worse still, what, is, what the South African public is worried about is that we're reaching a stage in managing governance in South Africa where there are a significant number of people in the bureaucracy and elsewhere and the boards who actually are taking a view which says, I don't care. I don't care if you know what I do. I don't care if you know that public resources are going elsewhere. I don't care how many reports the public protector or anybody else provides, because I'm protected. The question is by whom, and at what cost, and how will history record your role, ultimately, in this regard? Because this is the critical institution in the South African economy, as we learned in the period 2010 and thereabouts. That when Eskom doesn't work, it has a massive impact on economic growth. It has a massive impact on job creation in South Africa. It has a massive impact on enterprises in South Africa. And today, I don't think we've recovered from that yet, notwithstanding the, the fancy footwork that we've been doing. And uh, I, mean, I don't want to talk about the exchanges. So the first point I'm making, Chairperson, is context matters. That this is not just one isolated incident of hiring and firing and retiring and not retiring and maternity leave or otherwise. This is part of a pattern. Last week, the South African Council of Churches mm -hmm. uh, produced its preliminary report, which helps us to begin to connect the dots and understand what is actually happening in this context. And what we need to know from the board is, are they still going to do what we used to do as activists before the security police? 
the minister and the deputy minister will know that, I think. You know, we should keep a straight face, notwithstanding how many days we were in solitary confinement, and notwithstanding whatever pressure we were put under to answer questions about our affiliation to banned organizations or not. That's, that's what I see, straight faces. Because we believe that, you know, whatever we pout uh, out in the public domain, nobody's going to be able to challenge in any significant way. And sometimes we do it with extreme arrogance as well. It's remarkable. Whereas we're supposed to be serving a public institution. The second point is uh, worth repeating. In much of the literature of my party and its policy documents, and I'm sure many others share that as well, institutions like the state-owned entities are a crucial part of the developmental state. They are a crucial part of assisting the developmental process. But here we are busy uh, at all sorts of levels, parceling out state assets, state resources, state procurement to a handful of beneficiaries. And uh, again, if we think we're bluffing the public, we've got a thing coming. And that's why, Chairperson, what we do as a parliamentary committee can either give us credibility as parliament in this process, or we will also be accused of being co-conspirators, inverted commas, yeah. in, the, in this process. Yeah. So how we approach this question is going to be absolutely critical, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. If we go back to Mr. Mulefe, I mean, at some stage, perhaps when some of the colleagues have been talking about inquiries, if and when those inquiries take place, we need to go back to his role and the CFO's role in Transnet, and some of the transactions that are now coming under public purview and examination. Not a subject for debate today, but if you want to connect the dots, connect all the dots, and ask ourselves the question, who did what where, and in service of what cause at the end of the day. So that's the point I want to leave with you, Chair, and perhaps you can guide us on how we, how we take this matter forward. <clears throat> as, as many colleagues have pointed out, and I don't want to repeat, from the time of hire to the time for example, when the board met and said, no, we need to let this fellow go, or this gentleman go, to the point where the board said we need to hire them again, I think the legal advisors from, can, from Parliament can only do their job well if they have all the documents available to them. So we want all the board minutes certified by the chairperson of the board as the truthful representation of what happened at the board. If need be, we want to have the tapes of the minutes of, of, of the meetings of the board so that the legal advisors can have a look at that to see and verify whether the written minute is fairly representative of what the spoken word was. Let's have transparency. Let's have transparency. We all say we are accountable, we open, we are accessible. Well, let's open the books. Let's open the books so that the South African public can actually say, Everything is on, 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 on the table now, and we can actually <clears throat> do what is necessary. I think we need to ask you more directly as the board, who instructed you to rehire Mr. Murphy? Who made what phone call to whom? Or which meeting took place where with whom? As a result of which Mr. Murphy was rehired. I don't think we're going to get a truthful answer, by the way. But let, the question needs to be asked, nonetheless. Um, Chair, if you, if you would allow, I mean, each, uh, this is a very privileged interaction uh, that we have today, uh, certainly in my experience. Um, it would be nice, because I've seen some of the board members on television, it would be nice to hear from each of them what kind of interactions do they have with Oak Bay in their individual capacity, not as a board. Because as uh, Mr. Shivambo was pointing out earlier on in terms of the Powers and Privileges Act, let's hear the truth. Let's hear the truth about uh, what is really going on here. The legal advisors also need to tell us, Chair, as some have been saying, whether the board has indeed been acting recklessly and has been forsaking its fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility, let alone its developmental responsibility to South Africa. Um, to the minister, was there a legal opinion obtained 
which said what you can do and what you can't do, what you should agree with, what you shouldn't agree with, either by yourself, by the department, or by the board. Because ultimately, this is a labor relations issue. And uh, we can all speculate about who retired when or didn't. And many questions have been asked that I don't want to uh, go into. But secondly, why did you not litigate on the matter? 30 million rands, I know, compared to 30 billion rands, is a drop in the ocean. Because nowadays, you don't steal a million, not even 100 million, you steal a billion at a time. Yeah. You see? 100 million is not enough in the public domain. <coughs> So it's a billion at a time. So 30 million rands, nonetheless, is a substantial amount of money. Why haven't we litigated on this matter? Why did we just give in to somebody's demand, uh, as far as this is concerned? I've requested, Chair, the, 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 uh, if, you, if you agree, the various board minutes and so on, and, and, and if need be, in an affidavit form. In, in conclusion, I want to support the idea. Well, the minister perhaps might also want to tell us, you see, whilst a judicial commission of inquiry in terms of the Constitution is the prerogative of the president, hiring a retired judge to look into a particular matter, anybody can do, any minister can do. So why can't we have a retired judge or a senior counsel who is respected by all parties concerned? Uh, to come in, look at all the facts, yeah. you know, and do the necessary uh, in order to establish what really went on here and what are the facts. Secondly, we still have the option, perhaps we should debate that in the committee on our own, uh, of, of the full parliamentary inquiry. But this must be backed, thirdly, Chairperson, by a thorough forensic audit. We want a thorough forensic audit about how decisions made are made in ESCOM. ESCOM is far too important an entity for it to become a personal toy of a few individuals. It's a massive entity. We don't want to go into what it's uh, holding as state guarantees and so on at this point in time. Um, I would think respectfully that we might be arriving at a stage where either the board in its entirety should be dismissed or they should voluntarily resign. They have actually let South Africa down, more often than not. And uh, with great respect, I know Dr. Ingobane, for example, for a long time. Uh, but I don't think that the board has served South Africa well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take a five minute comfort break, yeah? Okay. Uh, one, five, five, All right. We will take a five minute comfort break so that
know I have rights <laughs> like anybody else in the committee. <laughs> Thank you very much and welcome back again. Um, I've got just a few concerns that I would want to raise with the minister and the, the board and everybody else that has, has come to listen to the committee and also who is holding a, 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 an answer to everything that has been, answer, uh, has been asked here. Minister, are you saying to this committee, if the chairperson of the board, I know that public enterprises is a shareholder, in, in, in a, a department, a, the department is a shareholder of all the entities that is under the department, it, it is not working like the other departments of, of, of other departments in 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 a, as a, according to the shareholder compact. I just want to check, check with you, uh, honourable minister, if the chairperson of ESCOM board signs a document within the entity. Are you saying to us, as per the policies of ESCOM, you as a minister, you, 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 the ESCOM board is not forced, or is, is, is not forced to give you that uh, document. They can sign a document without you knowing it. And then when now you will hear it from maybe from the media or from somebody else. Is that what you are saying in this meeting? And could you please quote for us? a legal document that, that states that, okay, so that uh, we, 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 we are clear on, what, or, 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 on the issues. Or when you do not have a right to object, if you object, you must object under certain, under certain issues or under certain circumstances. You, uh, Brian Mulife was a CEO in ESCOM. I take it the runnings, the, 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 the operations of ESCOM, Brian Mulife was the main man on the operations of, 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 of ESCOM. Then if the man, the main man leaves the job, so, Minister Wena, you'll just say, okay, he has lived. And then you, 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 you take weeks to know that actually it's the CEO that has resigned or it's the CEO that has stepped down. It's only now, only when the, the board again does something, you respond in saying, and then what, 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 what is happening? Because I take it, if the CEO of a company resign, and the oversight body should be the first people to know that that person, especially a person who is in a position like the position Brian Mulefi was holding in ESCOM, and have questions as a minister or as an oversight pe oversighting person, what? Why is he resigning? Is he resigning because of this? Then. If he's resigning because of this, this is what ESCOM should follow after, after the resignation of, of the CEO. Mr. Mulife again was sworn in in Parliament, as everybody has said so. When you are sworn in in Parliament, you take a permanent job for the five years of the sitting of Parliament. You take a permanent job in any organization. He was sworn in, in in Parliament. We were with him on the Thursday. Then when we went out of Parliament on Friday morning, leaving uh, the, the, the premises of Parliament on radio, he is employed as a CEO, re-employed as CEO in, 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 in the board. The, the, the processes that ESCOM has taken, a uh, chairperson of ESCOM, the processes, are they legally? Are those processes legal? Are they documented that I, as a member of parliament, 
a member of parliament this time because Prime Minister did not leave ESCOM to go and work in any other uh, organization. He came to parliament. I, as a member of parliament, therefore, ESCOM is at liberty to employ me at any, at any time. It is worse for a person who has resigned or has been retrenched or has been retired or has stepped down. It becomes worse. We just need an explanation. And this explanation, Minister, Deputy Minister, the board members. By the way, we called the minister, the ministry, and the board members, Honorable Singh, because we wanted the board members themselves. As Honorable Gordon has stated, all board members that are here must say something. That's why we have called this meeting. We wanted them to, to agree that we agreed as board members, in fact, to reinstate uh, Brian Mulefe. All of us, we took a decision and we agreed on that decision based on these things. And you give us the legal issues that made you to agree on, 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 those, on, on, the, on the issue of, of re-employing employing them, uh, employing Brian Mulefe. Minister, you said you are not employing. Therefore, you are not. You might not be acknowledged. It's not a force. It's not a legal thing for you. A legal um, thing for ESCOM to do to, um, to 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 inform you in good time that we are going to take these steps, like like employing the the GCO of 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 the of the board. Is that also on a legal document? Can we be given and look at them and see if this is a constitutional right or it is constitutionally right to happen? Um, my last, my, 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 my last, last, last question would be, or concern, yes, it's a question. Minister, you supported the Commission of Inquiry. You made a statement recently that you will support the Commission of Inquiry on ESCOM and, 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 and what, is the, what is happening in the company. That alone to me, Minister, means that you knew that there is something wrong in the company. Therefore, the inquiry must, must, ma, 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 must carry on. Do you still, in this meeting, support the fact that there must be a commission of inquiry. The, 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 the members of parliament in this portfolio committee wants this commission of inquiry. They emphasized, all of them emphasized on the commission of inquiry. Therefore, that would be our recommendations also that we, there must be a commission, a deep or a, a, a legal commission of inquiry with all the, what the members are expecting from, from that inquiry, with all the resources. All documents that are asked by the committee members we would want them to be sent as soon as possible because this does not end in this room. This does not end today. We are still going to pursue it as the portfolio committee. And also on Rule 167 of the National Assembly Rules, we are given powers there to summon anyone to give evidence in front of the committee. Therefore, with all the rights that we have, we are expected to serve the people of the country. It is said in this committee, Minister, Deputy Minister, Chairperson of the Board, the DDGs that you have in, in, in the entities that are here, the media people, we do not want anything, but we want the truth. So that we are able to face the communities around this issue. I was, in, I, the, the members have, have said a, a lot about who they met and who they spoke to. I was also, uh, called and asked by, 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 by a community member that it means we are being robbed by the same government because 
I worked for 48 years as an SAPS member and I was a lieutenant. But the money I got was less than a two million rands when I left the job. So for an, a, man, a man who works for 18 months and get a 30 million rand, what made them to give him 30 million rand? And also the issue of, in, on, in, in one of the documents of ESCOM, there's an issue spoke, speak, take, talking about 50, 50 years and 60 years. When I looked at it, I wanted, I, I want to know, do you work in ESCOM for 18 months? If I work in ESCOM for 18 months and I'm, 14, I'm 59 years, when I get to 60 years, does that rule apply to me also? I just work for one year. Does that rule apply to me? Or does that rule apply to a person who has at least worked for five years or for three years in ESCOM. Can we be explained in, 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 in what is happening in that role? I think the legal people of ESCOM, or, I mean, the legal uh, people from ESCOM will, will clarify that for us. And whoever has estimated or has come up with a decision of a 30 million rand can explain to us why was it 30 million in 18 months. The, 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 before I, 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 I I conclude, I just want to ask to know that we've got legal people from Parliament that I so wish before Dr. Mubani speaks, the legal people give us the, the, the give us a, a, just a, give us something on, on, on the issue of sub care and explain to us thoroughly the rule of sub care as per the rules of National Assembly. How does it work in a committee situation? Thank you very much. I'll, uh, before the responses from the department, the, 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 the ESCOM board and the, the minister, can we get the legal opinion from, from the legal people of parliament? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, the advice previously given to the committee uh, is what I am going to reiterate again. Um, just briefly, just to understand what the sub judicate rule is. Uh, historically, this rule was uh, created to protect the courts and juries from being influenced in the administration of justice. So it was to protect the administration of justice, especially with, in light of there being a jury system. But in South Africa, under the new dispensation with our constitution, there's a great move towards transparency and openness and the need for the public to know what's happening in the country. So in light of that and in light of our new constitutional dispensation, the courts have ruled on the issue of sub -judicate. And the Western Cape High Court in the decision of Midi Television um, set, very, set very stringent rules with regard to the application of the sub judicate rule. And just to understand, this was in relation to the publication and broadcasting of a criminal case. So even in an instance where there was issues related to a criminal case, the court felt that the right to know and the right for uh, the free flow of information outweighed the, the need to have certain information uh, kept under wraps. And the test that the court said was that there must be a real prejudice to the administration of justice. And even in such an instance, the, the curtailing of the free flow of information must outweigh the free flow of information. So the test is very stringent and such that we now have free reporting and broadcasting of uh, even criminal trials. So how do we relate that to Parliament and how does the rule, the sub decay rule apply to the National Assembly? If we start with, we know that, you know, there's the Constitution starts with saying there is a need for accountability, responsiveness, and openness. And if we start at the basics, what is the role of the National Assembly? The National Assembly is elected to represent the people and ensure there is oversight and scrutiny of executive action. And the Constitution gives the National Assembly specific powers to ensure that this role is met. 
And if we look specifically at um, section 56, B of the Constitution, it says the National Assembly or any of its committees may require any person or institution to report to it. So that is the power of the National Assembly. When there's an issue under consideration, the National Assembly or its committees may call any person to report to it. So how does the sub judicate rule fit into this power of the National Assembly? There's two, obviously the court has its own powers to deal with matters under consideration, but this does not curtail the National Assembly and its committees from carrying out its oversight responsibilities. These are two competing interests, but, and there may be an overlap, but the National Assembly cannot stop its functioning because the matter is before court. However, given the fact that um, there is this issue of separation of powers. The National Assembly itself has created a rule to curtail itself, and that's Rule 89. And Rule 89 is very specific and very limited. It says no member may reflect on the merits of any matter in which judicial decisions in a court of law is pending. So firstly, the rule applies only to members. It's something for members to take into consideration or that is applicable to them when they are asking questions. And that is mainly to respect the independence of the judiciary, to ensure that we don't make any negative comments about cases that may be pending, and also to respect the rights of litigants before the court. But that does not mean members cannot scrutinize and oversee uh, executive action and any matter before them. They must just have due regard to this rule. Secondly, this rule does not apply to members of the public. It only applies to members of the assembly. So when the members of the public or officials are asked to respond to questions, they are compelled to do so. That, the that they're relying on the sub rule does not have merit because the matter pending before court is not necessarily the same issues that this committee may ask for committee is exercising its oversight and accountability functions. And further, the, the, the committee does have specific powers when uh, members of the public refuse to participate, then they can be summoned uh, to appear before the committee and failure to cooperate in that instance uh, can result in criminal charges being brought. Uh, so Chairperson, that's briefly the, uh, the uh, subject decay rule and the powers of the committee. Thank you. Well, that's off the table. Thank you very much. So the matter yeah. is clear. Yeah. Could you please respond well, to the issue that the members have, um, yeah. have raised, uh, Honorable yeah. Minister and yeah. Dr. Mubane yeah. and your team? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I will give over to the Minister to respond to issues that have been raised by members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, in fact, members have made lots of comments, and there are a number of questions that they've asked. And um, uh, uh, can you hear me? Mem Am I mic still? <laughs> I don't have a voice that you can carry. I used to be a good teacher before. Um, what? <laughs> um, I'm, going to, I'm just going to go through the list of what I think are questions that people have asked. But I also think I want to later address myself to the, mat, the fact that um, to the issue of a further investigation, and maybe just to ask the chair, when you speak about the commission of inquiry, which commission of inquiry are you speaking about? So that I can respond. No, uh, Minister, I was speaking about the commission of inquiry you said you supported as the minister. Into state capture. In the state capture. OK. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, Didler Tulia summons me. The uh, Honourable Member Mazzoni's question. 
Um, the issue is that the top six often uh, engages with its deployees. And um, I consider this a normal engagement in that kind of respect. Um, what came out of that discussion was that we presented to the top six um, something similar that we presented to you today. And the, the top six um, had many, many, dis we had long discussion and we were then sent back the DM&I and we were told that the government will have to sort it out. So the president, the deputy president, myself had to sort it out. And we've established a committee to that effect that has both, that has a number of people in it. Um, and, um, and, and really what it is to do is to look at um, the legal, legal opinions of ESCOM, the legal opinions of my department, to sub, subject it to an independent uh, legal opinion, and then to make a decision out of that. The reason why I um, uh, did not, the reason I, it's in terms of A, of my affidavit, David part, affidavit part A, that I decided to, sorry, I'm just taking this in so I can't get it in there, that I decided not to oppose. It was largely to do with the fact that I, as I've actually been noted there as somebody who have made the appointment. Now, I've not made the appointment of um, Brian Malefi at all. In fact, um, and this will answer the questions later on as well, is a mem memoranda of incorporation and the court will have to um, address itself to that as well. Mr. Malefi, um, in terms of ESCOM, was appointed in terms of the 2014 memorandum of it, uh, incorporation. Um, Chairperson, this also answers your question. He was, and in that um, memorandum of incorporation, it says that, if I'm, I'm looking at my affidavit, it says that in 2014 paragraph 14.3.4, No, the 2014 MRI did not require the minister to be noted as a party to the employment agreement of the group's chief executive. In the 2016, remember I was appointed in 2014, in 2016 we um, re-looked the, the MRI and paragraph 14.3.4 of the 2016 MOI requires the minister to be noted as a party to the contract of employment between the company and the group chief executive. Now, there was another question asked of me, where it says, um, the, uh, well, um, the Honourable Member Mazzoni also asked for the details of the agreement of the 30 million. I think um, I pass that on to ESCOM. In fact, I also pass on to ESCOM where um, the issues around retrenchment, um, 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 resignation, and so forth. In my affidavit, I state, now my affidavit is done under oath. So if I lie in my affidavit, then that's, kind of the end of me as a public representative. But more importantly, it's probably the end of me as a person who I know. So, I say in my affidavit, I did not in any way act unreasonably. When I learned of the true facts, namely, that Mr. Mulefi has not, had not resigned. Remember the 11th of November, I actually, well, um, said, and I said it earlier, I think members didn't listen to me, but I said it earlier 
that I um, was, I said I was sad to see him go, but I wish him well with his resignation. So I did believe that there was a resignation. In fact, the first time when I saw the 30 million rand in the newspaper, that was the first time I knew about it. But that was because ESCOM thought that they were acting in terms of the MOI of 2014. And between 2014's MOI, Mulefi's employment and reinstatement and the 2016 MO, um, MOI, there is about three months difference. And that's, that's the issue. Now the court will have to um, address itself to this matter. And, and I have agreed in my affidavit that whatever the court decides, I will agree with that. So, um, so that's the issue. The advert for the CEO, the board will um, talk to. Um, let me talk, um, chairperson, to, the, the, to how, what the process of governance is in terms of my department. Now remember that my department was established initially as the Department of Privatization um, many, many years ago. So the department has six public enterprises in, within it. And the department, so much of what exists at the moment in the department exists um, because of historical um, relations too. So the department has a shareholder compact that is an agreement drawn between myself as minister and any one of the six state-owned companies. And that, agree, that shareholder compact is measured annually. So annually, externally, by the Auditor General or the um, company that is the auditor for that um, state-owned company, they will be assessed. So sometimes they meet the targets 56%, sometimes they meet 90% of the targets, sometimes they meet 80% of the targets, and there are um, consequences for wh whether or not you meet the targets um, below 60%. So, and of course it's, it's quite an intensive engagement. So the, the, the state-owned companies are governed, the relationship is governed like the, in that way. Then there is the Companies Act, and we draw for each one of the state-owned companies a memorandum of incorporation. And the memorandum of incorporation um, also deals with issues like the appointment of CEs, um, the kind of operational things within the company. And at what it also deals with um, the, sorry, the materiality and significance, significance and materiality document also deals with the various levels of decision making within whether I make the decision or whether the board makes the decision. So it's not something we do because we think, oh, this morning we wake up, how am I going to run the state of the company? It is very carefully legislated and very carefully, um, there's, there's re there are real memoranda and legislation that governs us, including, except for the now, all the state-owned companies actually have their own legislation as well. So ESCOM is governed by the ESCOM Conversion um, um, Act of 2001. Um, can we improve these acts? Yes, we can. But what the process is now is to try and um, deal with these governance matters in relation to the state-owned company reform process, which the deputy president chairs. Now thus far, 
because there are, there are governance issues and governance problems within the state-owned companies. Um, there are other problems in the state-owned companies as well that we've got to deal with. And I'll speak about how I want to deal with the issue. I was going to do it in my budget speech, but I might as well do it now, with the issues in, um, state, um, in ESCOM as well. But the idea is to have an overarching um, shareholder management bill. And now it's taken a long time for this thing to come about. But we are just at the point now where we've submitted to cabinet and all the ministers are now responding to the shareholder management bill. And the idea there is to stop the fragmentation that we've had in state and companies over the last um, how many years. Um, but also to standardize procedures, um, to ensure that we have it across all 22, at least the 22 big state owned companies and so forth. Um, having said that, the, the governance issues, state owned companies can do much better, but I do think it does belie the fact that state owned companies actually have been the hard metal of the backbone of the um, economy of our country. Um, especially the two large ones, Transnet and ESCOM. What did I do to ensure ongoing capacity? Is this my order? Um, in ESCOM, Honorable Member Lu Yenge, there's actually, um, you know, there are 42,000 workers in ESCOM. And I, man, I appointed, um, well, the board appointed Corco, Mr. Corco, and I supported that appointment. Mr. Corco, at this stage, um, as you've all mentioned in various ways today, um, has been asked to. Um, take leave while we complete the Cliff Decker investigation. And that's an investigation on all, into all these Sunday Times newspapers. And that report is supposed to be due quite soon. But there is a leadership gap at ISCOM at the moment. And I suppose in my reasoning, after Mr. Mulefi left, that gap was very, very um, prominent. And you've seen in the last seven to eight months all the stuff that's been happening around ESCOM. And so, um, whilst there's, there are incredible technical skills, there are engineers, there are um, civil engineers, they are, you know, they're just a number, nuclear physicists, they are just an, a number of highly skilled people in the company. Um, but we don't have the requisite leadership in the company, and that's what I was worried, that's what I'm worried about in terms of the present where we are at the moment. Um, Salaries, the, the, large, the two large um, state-owned companies sees earn seven and eight million. The rest of them earn in, the, in line with the number of those employed, etc. Et so they earn a, a, almost half or less than half of what the others earn. Of course, in the SOC reform process, we've passed the remuneration of non-executive directors and executive directors um, that will feed into the overall SOC um, state-owned company re reform where the salaries will be better managed. Because there's a very strong feeling in Cabinet that, we should, that when you work for a state-owned company, because it's both commercial and developmental, you are expected to almost um, be conscious, conscious of um, not having salaries higher than most of us. 
I don't know if that means we're going to bring the salaries down. Because these are large companies. Um, ESCOM has 42,000 workers. Um, Transit has 67,000 workers. They are large companies, and so we'll have to look at a proper median for um, um, the, the um, payment of CEs. Look, I just think it's too much. But I think I've got to subject myself to a legal process because it's governed by the labor law. Um, it's governed by how they've been paid over a period of time and so forth. So, um, but I, I, I do hear the point quite starkly and I think at some point we should be bringing the, the SOC reform process in terms of remuneration and, and board appointments um, to the portfolio committee. ESCOM is very important to this country and I agree with Honourable Minda Mondley. Um, it's important because it generates the electricity for the whole country. 95% of electricity is generated from ESCOM. Um, and there is a question mark. And I've, and the chair has raised this matter too, and many members have raised it. Brian Malefi will never be cleared until there's an investigation in, into the state, only, cap, state capture report. And so, but he can't do that. Um, he can't clear himself. That is something that, that we have to do. I heard Honorable Member Gordon saying today, um, that and many other members have also called for a an investigation. Now I was going to report this in my budget speech, but I do want an investigation into procurement at ESCO. Um, I I my department has already drawn up the terms of reference for it, um, and and that's separate to whatever. Um, the Parliament decides, um, but we will have a we will have an investigation, and um, at some point I thought we should do it with the SIU because we already have an agreement with the SIU, and they've done a number of investigations into ESCOM already, um, and um, but we we'll, we want to do it, and it will. It will have to deal with all seven investigations into ESCO, all inconclusive investigations um, in the last five years. And so it has to bring all of those together as well as do the investigations into the matters that are now before us. And look at, um, in specific, look at procurement at ESCO. Was the due diligence um, done around the 30 million rand? I think ESCOM can um, respond to that. I'm very conscious of the Powers and Privileges Act, Honorable uh, Member Shivambu, um, and therefore, whatever I'm saying in this room, I'm conscious of the, the fact that I'm a member of Parliament and I'm governed by the Powers and Privileges Act. I mean, Honourable Member, oh, Honourable Member CNAs, and thank you very much for your kind words. Um, but also, let me just say, did President Zou, Jacob Zuma instruct me? Now, as is normal, I actually went to tell him, when Eskom told me that they were going to appoint um, um, Brian Malefi as the CE, um, or reinstate him, I said, I told Jacob Zuma that. I told the president it's the norm. I always do so. I went to the um, officials of the ANC and I also told them. And I met with all six of them and um, so that's not a, it's not a thing that I wouldn't do. 
But did I get an instruction? Now, if you all look in my eyes as you ask me that, no. I did not get an instruction to do so. I said earlier in my opening remarks that when I, when I stopped the 30 million, and Honourable Member Gordon is maybe right, I should have allowed Brian to go and litigate, but I didn't do that at the time. Because the four options he put before us, or not he put before us, there were four options that um, when I told ESCOM that they must renegotiate, um, the, the four options they put before me, uh, that is an alternative, I said go and get an alternative um, pension proposal. Um, it was not possible because it has to change, will change the pension fund rules. The settlement payment, and I was not happy with the settlement payment for probably exact reasons, members around the table are not, unha are not happy with the settlement payment, because that would then be a golden handshake. Um, then the third one is that he resigns um, with a settlement. And if he doesn't agree, then we go to court. And the last one is, Brisson, based on the fact that I didn't want them to pay out the 30 million rand, and Mlefi remains CEO of ESCOM. And those are the, the proposals that were put before me. And the proposals put before me, they also said, the board said that they've made a decision, and I mean, I'm sure you're going to ask the board members, um, that they will, they prefer the option of rescinding, or they've taken the option to rescind based on my request, and remains, and Brian remains the CEO of ESCOM. Now, in the law, in I, I, when, the first time I spoke about it into the public space was at a press conference I held probably a week ago. And at that press conference, I said that based on the legality of it, that's what I will, will do. I will support the um, Brian Mulev coming back as CEO. But I said very distinctly based on whether or not it is legal. Um, the other issue that I need to raise is the fact that um, based on whether it's legal, oh, the board also assured me and I had no reason to doubt, and I put that in my affidavit <coughs> as well. I had no reason to doubt that the board, um, I believed on the strength of the legal advice received by ISCOM and communicated to me, and which I had no reason to doubt, that once the contract of early retirement has been mutually rescinded on the basis of an error, it would inevitably mean that the state would status quo would have to be restored. And that I make in my affidavit. Um, should we have a retired judge? Let us listen and, and, and ask questions thereafter. Let us note our questions so that we get the full information and interrogate the information that we get. Um, I, I have subjected myself to court proceedings. ESCOM has subjected itself to court proceedings and Brian Malefi is subjected to court proceedings. So 
I'm also hoping that greater clarity on all of these matters taken to court will be before us. Um, the court um, sits on the 30th of May. I think, Honourable Member Nobanda, I have responded to your question of do I report to ESCOM or do ESCOM report to me? I have spoken to the, to the governance processes that happens between all of us and who determines in terms of the significance and materiality at what levels the decisions are taken. And um, I think it's a public document. It's a public document, like the MOI is a public document. Um, so those matters could be looked at at that level. Then there are lots of statements made. If you know, on, in any of the state-owned companies, of any untoward behavior where <coughs> Um, board members are actively involved, or executives are actively involved in ensuring that any particular um, corrupt activities happen, then that should be reported. You can report it to the necessary authorities, um, it must be, in fact, you, you have an obligation to report it to the necessary authorities. So what, I'm, what I want to do with the inquiry is to lift all of the issues that ESCOM could have, so that I don't see it in the media, um, into the future, and lift those issues out of ESCOM. Then I know what the conclus conclusions were of all the investigation reports. But lift those so that the areas where they are, because there are areas in all of the reports where it says you must continue to, to, to investigate this or that. Lift those out and get this, um, whoever does the investigation, whether it's a retired judge or whether it's the SIU, that we get um, all the matters that ESCOM could possibly have into the public space. I'm going to, um, if, if I haven't answered somebody's question that you really want answered, please just ask it again. Because, I mean, Chair, uh, 20, 10 people's questions, are, it's sometimes difficult to follow all of these. Yes, we'll, we'll come back to you, Minister, with those questions that are not answered, that are directed to you. But we will now give over to the chairperson of the board to answer the questions that are relevant to you. Sure. Just switch it on. Thank you, chairperson. Well, let me start off by saying this board will welcome any forensic, any type of investigation into ESCO. We'll, we'll welcome it tomorrow, not, not next year, tomorrow. Our legal person here, well, she works with legal, but she's also company secretary, has written to the public protector to give us information so we can start our own application in order to clear up the state of capture report. We sent boxes of information to the public protect. Bring in any auditor, any forensic investigator, let them look at the evidence. We use double assurance at ESCOM for any major decision. It is ultimately the Audit and Risk Committee and our assurance and forensic. But on top of that, we have independent auditors. This is why we have had clean audits year after year with minor statements where things have not been fully explained. The record speaks for itself. 
We found an organization that was on the brink of collapse. The chairperson of the time and the CEO of the time phoned the minister on Boxing Day and said, we'll not be able to pay salaries. And that's when we came in December 2014. That was the situation. We worked very hard to try and remedy this. We searched for money in all sorts of hidden places in terms of knowing exactly what assets were there. We devised design to cost. We brought in experts like McKinsey. You know, we did so many things. And then, of course, the minister agreed that Brian should come to, ex to ESCOM. That was at the height of load shedding. In the beginning of that winter, Glencoe comes to ESCOM and says, we want 150 rand per ton stopped because we want you to pay us 550 rands per ton. Our exports are down, the commodities markets are down, and Brent said correctly, go fly a kite. We won't do that, NASA will not allow it, because our prices for coal and primary energy are determined by NASA. But also even our auditors would consider this irregular and wasteful expenditure. That's when the negotiations started for alternative supplies of coal that winter. We wanted over a million tons stockpile. Otherwise, we're going to go into a blackout. And Glencoe said it clearly. We will stop supplying Andrina and we'll have a blackout in the country. Those were the, Minister Gordon, you know, said the context was important. The context is very important because I hear phrases like, ESCOM is a mess, ESCOM is being torn apart, and yet our finances don't speak that language. You will see our results. You will see how much improvement has happened in terms of savings, in terms of EBITDA, in terms of the management contracting that we have done with our senior managers, holding them to certain levels of EBITDA, holding them to no blackouts in order to get bonuses, etc. But, you know, please, the board has worked very hard. South Africa must at least acknowledge that. I don't know why. I don't know why it's so easy to rubbish everything. Everything. You know, there was the state capture report. She can tell you what processes she has undertaken to get into the review process of the state capture report. We're not there yet. It's not our doing. Now, let me come to the second part. This whole thing about Brian Malefe, once the minister expressed reservations, we asked our legal people to consult with lawyers, to consult with counsel, to find the optimal way of resolving the issue. And the minister stated that we came to her and we came a number of times, we presented the scenarios, and ultimately the scenario that we resorted to was, in terms of legal opinion we had, the only safe way to solve this thing is to cancel that early retirement agreement. Now let me come back to early retirement. When someone retires from an organization, whether it's in terms of fulfilling the age limits or getting early retirement, that person moves out of the organization. That person is free to do whatever he or she wants to do. He can start a business, he can go to another employer, etc. When a person resigns, he takes only what he has contributed to the provident fund and the pension fund. That's what he goes away with. And if there is some leave that was not taken, he gets paid for that. And that's the end. Here, after we signed the agreement to purchase 10 years for Brian, to make up for the gap in terms of the break in service from PIC to Transnet, then to ESCOM, 
we decided, the board decided to buy him 10 years so that when he gets to 55, he can then, and is forced, therefore, to stop work because it now became a fixed contract, he can have the benefit of savings in terms of his pension benefits. That was done in 2015. We never anticipated that he will ask to use that option in November for, you know, what precipitated all that. We didn't factor that in. But we had a signed agreement that we bought him 10 years and therefore he could save his benefits in terms of the breakup in his service career. All right? When he said he's using this option, and this is the letter we have in our records, that was given to our administrators, to HR. The primary affair has asked for early retirement. The board has examined this and approved management administration send it to the pension fund. The pension fund, the board met of the pension fund. They said, fine, we accept this early retirement. And then they calculated what was going to be the pension that will be paid every year, I mean every month going forward, and that came to 30 million. Now, this is when even ourselves woke up to the fact that the pension benefits will be 30 million. And the shareholder said, this cannot happen. So we spoke to him. He said, his lawyers had said, there was a signed agreement, his rights stand. Then we said, we will spend our days in court because obviously that will not be acceptable. With a lot of persuasion, we managed to have consensual agreement that will rescind his early retirement. And the lawyer said, that goes back to square one. In other words, unless he resigns, he then comes back to work for ESCO. That was the sequence of events. All this is in our documents to court, in our affidavit. It is now for the court to decide whether this was legal or not. But as far as we were concerned, we acted on the best advice that this country's legal eagles can provide. And we're satisfied that they've advised us correctly, and the minister was satisfied that they've advised us correctly. We're not re-employing this man. He was simply reverting to the status quo because the original agreement that he can take early re retirement had been rescinded. Now, you know, they are not, these are not shenanigans. This is what happened. But I'm saying, please, start the inquiry, start the commission, start whatever you want. Take every recording of our board meetings. Take all the minutes that we have. Take the reports we have sent to National Treasury. Let it be examined very, very carefully. And then you can pass judgment on this board. I will defend this board up to the end because I know how we have worked, how strenuous it has been. You know, the documentation, I mean, Dr. Pat Naidu was chairman of the new build program of the board. Medupi, Husile, beset by serious problems, huge overruns, huge claims by the contractors, poor management of the con in, in terms of the con contract management office. He worked very hard to clean that up. Then we caught up with the time that we had lost with the new build program. That's why now we're back in the normal rhythm of finishing our boilers, of finishing our commissioning, of finishing our synchronization of the new power stations. We have done well, and thanks to him. Ingula shouldn't have been finished by now, but we completely commissioned all the three units of Ingula. We are busy with the other units at Kusile. We are going to meet the target of 2018 
to 2020 with massive new build programs. That means sitting up at night, going through all the documentation, submissions coming from management on the particular issue. I don't sit normally in committees, but I've set up on the new build. You, you should see the amount of work, teasing out why is uh, Hitachi, etc., claiming so much money, questioning that. I mean, we are not a bunch of idiots. We just want to be called board members of, of ESCOM. We are there to work. So please at least give us, give us that benefit of the doubt. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. We said we want all the board members to, 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 to respond. I, I, I want to give to the board members, to the other board members, to respond so that we take follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Honorable Chair, honorable members, thank you for the opportunity to represent ESCOM at this discussion. Uh, my name is Pat Naidu, member of the board. Uh, just some context for myself. I grew up in ESCO. I did my 27 years at ESCO. And now with the three years on board, I've completed three decades at ESCO. We've grown a company that has assets of 700 billion rands. The liabilities to date of 450 billion rands, of which the current liabilities are 78 billion rands. The owner's equity is 180 billion rands, of which share capital is 80 billion rands, which comes from Treasury, and retained earnings is 100 billion rands. So it's a huge operation, it's a massive operation. It's amongst the world's best utilities. It certainly received the prize of world's Best utilities earlier in 1991 slipped a bit, but it's going right back there to get the title of world's best utility. Our revenues for the last year, ma'am, has been a total of 180 billion rands. ESCOM is treasury. ESCOM makes money. ESCOM prints money. The EBITDA is about 40 billion rands. I'm just giving you all the round numbers. Net profit. 1 billion rands. And with that revenue, we spend 100 billion rands on primary energy. And ESCOM's primary energy is coal. 100 billion rands goes to coal. And that's why you see coal is on the agenda and coal is the subject of discussion. The wealth created is a total of 80 billion rands and the wealth distributed is about 80 billion rands of which it's split equally to employee benefits, 40 billion rands, and we pay the finance charges for the monies that we borrow on the international markets and domestic markets to fund our operations. And therefore, it is so important, it is so important that we protect and grow the credit rating of ESCOM. We shouldn't be doing anything in the public space or in that space of government or ESCOM or anybody for that matter to hurt our credit rating. That's all it does it costs us more money to do business. Not we, but the end customer pays for this fight of ours that we have at various levels. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later as I cover my conversation. I want to talk about my entry into ESCOM. I was, in 2014, elected, or no, elected as a president of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. And as the custodians of engineering in the country, electrical engineering, we were very troubled, very troubled by the performance of ESCO, knowing well that we had been part of growing and building ESCO. We had lots of discussion at SAIE House, and we also went and brought the wise words of Dr. Ian McRae to come and join us in that conversation. Dr. McRae, the past chief executive of ESCO, under whom I was his, he was my mentor. And we we're so troubled that when we saw the advert from public enterprises calling for nominations to the various boards of state enterprises, we put up our hand. And my nomination went from the institute offices to public enterprises offices. And that's how I came to feature onto the ESCOM board. 14th of December, I was appointed for a period of three years, which ends 
this year, December 2017. When we got to the board, we all met each other. Dr. Ben Ngubani was there, myself, Mr. Koza, and fellow board members. And we set up now the task of organizing the committees for the board. And the first task that I was given was that of the board ad hoc committee of ESCOM emergency, ESCOM emergency recovery and ESCOM build recovery. And when I looked at the terms of reference for those two there, committees. There, there's an order. There's, there's somebody raised an order. Sorry. Uh, by the way, you're missing. Pat Naido, sir. Mr. Naido, I don't think we would be a mess to know how great you have been yeah. since you got to us. Now, just a moment, Chair. I'm giving the context. I'm raising a point of order. You must just wait now when I'm talking. I don't think we are averse to you telling us how great you have been. We're dealing with the issue of Prime. You have said nothing about it. I am coming to Prime. No, but get to it. That's what we want. What Thank you. We will not have a problem when you have been great for Thank 27 you, years. Thank We're you, sir. dealing with Prime. Thank you, sir. We'll get right there. Right. Thank you very much. By the way, right. we have a member from, uh, from public uh, administration, a member of my right. honorable member that has joined us in this committee for today. I just want to acknowledge Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Minister. Question about that uh, board members. The one was the issue of whether they agreed with, with the board, with Brian, and the second one, that the chair should chair the meeting. And the second one is, that they should say whether they have any relationships with Oak Bay. Yeah. Thank yes, you very much. Could you put, please, Mr. Naidu, get to the issues. Thank you. And, and the third one was, I think they resigned. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get to that now. I need to give the context because you've got to understand how Brian entered the pictures. That's where I'm going to. In my first meeting with Minister Brown, I had said to Minister Brown, Minister Brown, you should appoint some of us as executive directors, not as non-executive directors, because we need to get into the machine and help recover this machine. And Minister Brown said very clearly to us, I will not have that. You all are non-executive directors, and you all are not to get into the machine at all. I said, thank you, ma'am. Point taken. We then began to clean up ESCOM as such at the leadership level. Because the feedback we were getting from the existing management was load shedding will go on forever, for a long time to come. It's not going to stop now. And in that discussion, we fused the two committees, ESCOM Emergency and ESCOM Build and Recovery, into one. We asked the existing leadership to step aside. Sorry, Mr. Knight, we are dealing with the re reappointments, not the first appointment of Mr. Brian because. We were given, we were given the, 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 the explanation that you are given was given to the committee when Brian was was was, was appointed as a as, as a CEO in, in taken from Transnet and be transferred to to the C, to become a CEO in, in at ESCO. And we were given that history. Could you please get to the reappointment of Brian Olivier? Because we at two o'clock at least by half past one. We must be out of this place to go in and prepare for a budget holds, please. Uh, 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 I don't think, Mr. Naju, you, Mr. Naju. Yes, sir. I, I don't think it's going to assist this week. If, if you don't have clarity on some of the issues that you have raised, there's nothing wrong with you saying, I can't say anything. So that you are going to assist this week. Let's agree, Chair, that we go to the next board member if he does not have any issue that he wants to clarify. There's nothing like wrong. Because you will continue to insist on issues that are going to assist this week. Because you have said on a number of occasions, please, he must talk to the issues that relate to the rings that he can talk relevant. Please, let's go to the next board member. Thank you, Mr. Teddy. Mr. Naidu, for the last time, we ask you to stick to the question and talk about the reinstatement of, 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 of Mr. Brian. 
Mr. Mr. Prime Minister. Honorable uh, Shivam, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think that there is there's, there's a question as well. We have got a relationship with Oakby. So you can talk about that. The autobiography would only invite me to Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable members. Can we give uh, Mr. Naidu the last chance? Let's go straight to Mr. Mulefi's term when he had resigned and he had returned back to ESCO. One minute, ma'am. Yes, yes, Mr. Naidu, continue. Honorable members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Following the state capture report, we received, and I also heard it on television and publicly, that Mr. Molefi had resigned from ESCO. And we understood that Mr. Molefi has now left and he's gone. That was our understanding. When the paperwork came to board, the paperwork read early retirement. That gives very good clarity as to where you picked up the resigned from and where you picked up the early retirement from. The paperwork then followed its process. There's the ESCOM pension fund involved in this discussion. It remains completely neutral. It's an issue between employer and employee, and the paperwork followed its trail. Very clear. Mr. Mulefi is returned to ESCOM. When the paperwork was processed by the ESCOM Pension Fund, and unknown to us what the quantum was, it was publicly stated that the value was 30 odd million rands, which our minister at that point duly declined. Now, you interrupted me earlier on a very important point that I was going to make. When Minister Brown had said to me, you will remain as non-executive directors and not go into the machine. I then said to Minister Brown, Minister Brown, the buck stops here. We as the board will make the decisions for ESCO. We are the accountable accounting authority for ESCO. And therefore, Minister Brown will keep saying to you, I didn't know. I didn't know about this till the last minute or to when I saw it in the press. It's for that very reason. I only met Ms. Minister Brown I think on three or four occasions, one at induction, once at the annual general meeting in 2015, once at the annual general meeting last year, today, that's the only time I see Minister Brown. We have no communication whatsoever with the shareholder. All communication is via the chairman. Second point, and you disturbed me earlier, the chairman does not sit on any of our committees. None of the committees. He, was, he, wasn't, he wasn't chairman at that time when he sat on my build and recovery committee. He was an ordinary member. Zoldo Sotsi was chairman. I'm giving you the clarity and the documentation is there. Chairman Ben Gubani never participates in any of our committees. We'll give you all the records and you can take it. It's all available. On, on Molefi's return to ESCO. Yes, we, we understood Molefi is gone. Therefore, the process of advertising for the chief executive had commenced. Yes. Certainly. Because our understanding is gone. Very clear. We started the process. It was advertised. The recruitment agency was appointed. We met with them. We received the shortlisted candidates. That process was continuing. And that process was halted when Minister Brown declined the 30 million pension fund payout to Molefi. Very simple. And we said to ourselves, put that process on hold till we understand further what we do. And the shareholder representative had said to us that your decision to award him a pension fund needs to be reviewed. We sat down, we looked at the review of it. 
And we came up with the conclusion that we have two choices. Rescind the decision, and with that goes two consequences. He either resigns or he returns to work. Very simple. Very simple. We debated it. We sought legal advice. We sought audit advice. And we prepared our case in terms of meeting our stakeholders, the customers, and to explain to them why we had to go that path. There's the information, very clear. Some water. <laughs> Thank you. On the next question, have I got any relationship with Oakby? The answer is no, absolutely no, none. Since you've asked the question on Oak Bay, let me talk about Glencoe. The Glencoe discussion started at Eskom board long before Mr. Molefi arrived. We were approached, or before I explain that, Glencoe owns the optimum contract that supplies, when we say coal, it's no coal, it's the ground, literally the ground. This has been a design that goes back 50 years. The boilers were specially prepared to receive the ground at Henrina. They 200 megawatt units, and there's 10 of them. The ESCOM super thermal stations are 600 megawatts, and there's six of them. And they use a very different grade of, that's probably coal. This ground has got no value, absolutely no value, to anybody anywhere in the world, neither to a neighboring power station can only be burnt and used or employed at Henry. When we received the request from, and sorry, that contract was expiring or is expiring in 2018. When we received the request from management, management came with that request. Glencoe wants more money for this ground. And there's a clause in that contract called hardship. When the, you, you, when the power station was initially built, the contracts are put in place, so they're long-term contracts, 50-year contracts. There's a clause there that says, if you've got hardship, you can come and plead hardship. And that's exactly the clause they invoked, and they came to plead hardship. And I was on the board committee that said to them, Glencoe, just as you've got hardship, we also got hardship. Declined. Goodbye. We're not paying any more money for that coal. And the low price of the coal of Eskom's coal is the reason why Eskom promoted world's lowest cost energy, and we became the world leader in that. And we want to go back to that position. And that is the reason, say, I was giving you those primary energy numbers right at the beginning. ESCOM is all about coal. We convert coal into electrical energy. The price of coal determines the price of electricity to our customers. And we've got to do everything in our power to make sure that those contracts are not on a runaway. We've got to contain them. And Glencoe was very smart to come and ask for a price increase, knowing that the contract is expiring in 2018. So they'll set a new base price for the next 30 year period going forward. So now customers would need to pay that higher price for the next 30 year period. And we were adamant. And they said to us, we will throw in the towel and we'll declare business rescue. The consequences thereof being loss of jobs, but most importantly in the load shedding scenario, loss of production. We had our contingency plans and we were confident. And we weren't buying the hostage situation of loss of production. That is the Glencoe issue. We've got no relationship with Glencoe or at anyone. It was straightforward supplier, customer communications, and that was the conversation that we had all the time. Let me stop there. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. The last member of the board, and we, 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 give, we are going to give you one minute. We are running out of time. There's still other um, follow-up questions that are coming. Okay. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members of the Parliament and uh, colleagues, uh, I'll just go straight to retirement. The application form that we received from Brian was the application for retirement. Number two, I got no personal or direct relationship with the Oak Bay. Number three, we did support the reinstatement of Brian as the Chief and Executive on the basis of his performance 
the performance of the organization, the strategy that we put in place going forward, and also from the legal advice that we obtained uh, at the time to say we got those particular options and he can choose and he shows the application that he wants to come back. And another matter which came up here is the state capture matter. We did look at this particular matter and the things that were said and uh, the legal opinion that we obtained, it was said these were just allegations and it was for further investigation, therefore we cannot go and uh, ask for review. And that was the uh, 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 advice that we got from the legal opinion. Initially, and you, anyone can recall that the chairperson did say we're gonna go for review, but the legal opinion that we got, they said it's not the findings, you can only review the findings, therefore we could not do that. Therefore, that's why we all agreed to say we can restate Brian based on his performance and all the legal advice that we obtained. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to give two members. They are going to go on in this order. It's Honorable Mumbedo, Honorable Mazoni, Honorable Stenhazen, Honorable Shivambo, and Honorable Singh. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Mr. Naidu assisted to confirm, to confirm something. I think his response to me has confirmed why the parliamentary hearing is necessary. I would have doubted before he spoke. After he has spoken, I'm very clear that I think we need that. Because I just want to say to you, Mr. Naidu, my biggest worry is my first general statement is that both yourself and the chairperson, you, you, you don't care about, you, you don't care, you don't care about the effect of Brian Mulefi's reinstatement with regard to the reputation of Esco. And I've been listening to you, Babungubad. All what you are telling us about us are the numbers. In other words, you are saying, if we've got numbers, we've got money, shut up. What's your problem? The balance sheet is healthy. That's what Naibu is saying. The balance sheet is healthy. Shut up the questions of the public about the state of ESCO. That's nonsense. You, you actually said that without using those words. We got the money, shut up, there was no money. You said the same thing about SABC, that when you got there, there was no money. As we speak now, they are struggling to get money. <coughs> I don't know how long did you leave that place. So all I'm saying, both your answers have actually confirmed why inquiry is needed. Because I, I guess we don't find each other, we don't sing from the same page. You think that what about money? Two. Minister, I just want to go to the in incorporation. What do you call it? What do you call it? Memorandum. Memorandum of incorporation. Memorandum of incorporation reads as follows. No, no, I've got it it's here. Let me read it. It says, this memorandum of incorporation was submitted and adopted by special resolution passed by the shoulder of the government on the 1st July 2016. That's what I'm reading now. It says in 3.6.2, uh, 3.6.2, they will get the paragraph. It says the company shall not appoint or remove the chairperson of the board, the group chief executive or group financial whatever, the other than is provided for in this MOI. I'll come back to that. It also says in 3.8, the shareholder may direct the company to take any action. That shareholder is yourself. Mm. To take any action specified by the shareholder, which is yourself. If the company is if, 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 if the company is in financial difficulty or is being mismanaged, in other words, got the power articulated in this memorandum. And that man, uh, Mr. Naidu said that the buck stops with them. And I'm reading this, unless, I'm, I'm actually, I'm reading Greek here. This is not the English as I understand it. It further says the shoulder, if 
the, if, if the company fails to perform its function effectively, the shoulder has a duty to direct. This is how this document is, is written here. Now, it explains what the shoulder should do if that is failed. Let's go to 14.3.2. The shareholder, that is the process of the appointment or, or, and the removal of the of the group chief executive officer. It says that the shareholder shall on behalf of the company have the exclusive power in exercising its ownership of control pursuant to the provision of section 3 da, 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 to appoint and remove the C as an employee of the company in accordance. This is in your MOI. In other words, you are not powerless as articulated here because if I understand this, this seems to be saying that. You will explain what does this mean. Because it says, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but it says the shareholder has this. But now, having said all that, you say Brian can't clear himself. But in the, in the public project, it's about Brian and his conduct. But who should clear Brian? And you said, I said I will accept if the legal opinion so agrees. The question now is, did you get the legal opinion? Quickly, <clears throat> uh, the legal opinion by the board. <laughs> now, the last point I want to make is that I have a sense that, Minister, you did not exercise your role of oversight in directing a school. Unless you read these things differently. But I'm also disappointed in the general response that we seem not to be equally worried about the general public opinion about the state of protocol of ESCO. You want to convince us about finances. And Mr. Naidu said, Brian resigned. So all I'm saying, I do say, based on these responses, an inquiry, parliamentary inquiry, in my view, is required. If it clears you, Babu Ngubane, so be it. I don't think there's a problem. And I think we concur with you on that. Honorable Mazon. Yes. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, uh, isn't it lovely to hear a fabulous income this company That means I assume that uh, this application to NURSA will no longer be necessary, and South Africans aren't going to be able to be panicking about how they're going to pay increased tariffs considering that's all ESCOM ever does is ask for more and more and more, but all we hear is how fantastic the financial status is of ESCOM. Mm -hmm. yeah. When one looks at Madupi and, and Kusile, let's not forget the controversy around there, and I refer specifically to the Hitachi deal. That was absolutely unacceptable. Another slap in the face. So when the board members come here and very proudly suggest that they've done nothing wrong, I put it to each one of you board members that you are a shame to the South African nation. And you shouldn't sit here and think that you're doing everything right. Keeping the lights on in this country is your job. It's your only job. And how dare you even think that you should come here and be congratulated for keeping the lights on. You have one job. Chair, I get very angry because when people turn back on a legal opinion that is so obviously flawed, and then Dr Ngobani says that we treat them like idiots, so I put it to you that you treat us like idiots. How can it be that every legal opinion in the country differs to your legal opinion, but still you choose to accept the legal opinion that no one else agrees with? Minister Brown, did you know this? Because clearly you're being kept in the dark from a lot of things in ESCOM. I am being sued for a total of 80 million rand. I actually know that. Yeah, well, well, let me get to the point. 30 million rand by ESCOM, so to your board, 20 million by COCA, and 50 million by Brian Malefi. You have very proudly appointed Cliff decker Hofmeyer to investigate Minister uh, um, Chairperson Coco at the time. This is the very law firm that you have employed to sue me. So, we look at the conflict of interest there. The firm that you are employing to sue a member of parliament is also the firm that you are using to do an investigation into. So, basically, they're investigating their own client. Oh, I see a lot of clarity coming out of that investigation.
unacceptable behaviour by the board. But still, Minister Brown, you let this board continue. I'm not going to mince my words. Minister Brown, we are being lied to. I think you have been lied to. It is very obvious that Brian Malefi resigned from ESCOM. The spin that the board is putting on is now actually embarrassing. I am cringing for you. I am seeing what the country is seeing and I am cringing for you. Minister Brown, this board is an embarrassment and a disgrace to South Africa. Please take my advice. Suspend this board with immediate effect. Thank you, Honourable Sadi. Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm highly disappointed with the responses that we received around this particular matter. And I want to make a follow-up uh, with regard to some of the issues that have been raised. And I'm going to read from uh, what one of the papers uh, reported some few days ago. As one chief executive officer, Ben Mulif and Public Enterprises Minister Len Brown have both filed affidavits claiming Mulif was on unpaid leave while he was a member of parliament. And the direct question is how far is this true? I asked the question earlier, and that question was not entertained, which to me is very, very pertinent in terms of us taking this particular matter forward. Because you seem to be very confident, uh, including the chairperson of the board and the other board members. If we were to pursue this particular case now, do we have a winnable case? Are you ready to take personal responsibility if this case does not go your way? Because we can't continue to use state resources on matters that we know they are not likely to go our way. So two direct questions. How far is this thing through? Are we ready to take personal responsibility if the case does not go our way? Do we have a winnable case now that we are pursuing this particular matter? Thank you, Honorable Stevenson. Thank you very much. Just before that, great. Um, Minister, thank you very much uh, through you, Chairperson, uh, for your responses. Um, sorry, excuse me, I'm a, a layman and I'm new in this committee. Can I just get clarity why the 2014 memorandum of, of MOI was used and not the 2016 one? I, I'm not clear about, about why that was the case. There was a 2016 one. Um, the shareholder management bill, I think it certainly would be welcomed. Um, but to be honest with you, Minister, I mean, serving on the programming committee, there's very little chance that bill's going to get, see the light of day until early next year. And so I think I would ask you what immediate steps outside of the bill you're taking to rectify some of the matters that are identified as problems within that bill. Steps that can be taken now, because um, the lead time on that bill is massive. Minister, you said that Mr. Malefi has no way of clearing his name. He does have a way of clearing his name. The court was very clear on this in Encondra matter. If you are unhappy with the report of the public protector, you are within your right to take such report on review. Mr. Malefi, to my knowledge, has not instituted such review proceedings of that report and uh, is certainly not seeking, and if he's relying on the President to do so, the aspects of the report that the President uh, is seeking to review relates mainly to the remedial action in terms of the appointment of, uh, of how a judicial uh, commission is appointed thereafter. It doesn't deal with the telephone calls between Mr. Gupta and Mr. Mulefe. It doesn't deal with the serious allegations there. And I'll put it to you, Minister, that in fact, as long as that report stays in the public domain, and Mr. Malefi does not challenge those findings in court, I would say to you that the, there has to be an element of truth to that, because if I was a public figure and under such public scrutiny as Mr. Malefi, and I honestly believed that I'd been wronged in that report and that those findings were incorrect, I would have been in for a review process months ago. 
Why has Mr. Malefa not instituted a review proceeding? I can only presume from his inaction and unwillingness uh, to use the mechanisms available to him to clear his name in a court of law as acceptance that there's an element of wrongdoing and guilt on his own behalf. I also think that that's why he left Eskim, it stands to be said to clear his own name. So I disagree with you. He absolutely has an ability to clear his name. He's not using that mechanism, and um, therefore those allegations stand above him. I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to now address myself, Chairperson, to the board, and particularly Mr. Ngabani. Mr. Ngabani, I've sat in this movie before, as is Mr. Singh. We sat in the SABC inquiry where Professor Maguve, right up until the last minute, told us how wonderful the South African Broadcasting Corporation was, how well managed they were, how they were world leaders in entertainment and in the way they were doing things. And we all know now, with respect, Mr. Gabani, that that was not the truth, that the SABC was rotten to the core and that there were fundamental problems there. And I would advance to you, Mr. Gabani, that the same applies to Eskin. One only needs to open a newspaper on a daily basis, to put on carte blanche on a Sunday night, to see the devastatingly destructive behavior of people within your organization. And so all is not well in the state of Denmark. There is something rotten in the state of Denmark. And I'm not encouraged by what appears to me your naivety and blasé attitude.
Because certainly I don't think you've conquered our minds into thinking that all is well with UNESCO. There are more questions that we need to ask, Chairperson. <coughs> the purpose of today's meeting was to receive a briefing by the Minister and the Board of ESCO, which I think we've done. We've asked as many questions as we could ask, but like I say, there are many, many, many more questions that we still need to ask. You know, the surprising thing is, it reminds me of what my leader said in a debate not so long ago, a motion of no confidence debate. He said, why would we want to destroy this country because of one person? And I ask this question, why would we want to destroy ESCO and the good work that they are doing because of one person? Does that one person have so much of influence over the board, over the minister, uh, and over other functionaries in cabinet, and other people? as I said, using this as a automatic teller machine, uh, ESCO, for themselves. But Chairperson, I think uh, Honorable Gordon asked for some documents. We've all, all asked for more information. And we reserve our right as a committee, I want to propose, uh, to call the minister and the board for a future meeting. And what I'd like to suggest is that we apply our mind as a committee on the way forward. I think there were many suggestions. Uh, impressing upon the minister to have her own inquiry, which she's entitled to do, having our inquiry, parliamentary inquiry, but let us apply our minds, because I don't think we'll be able to get any more answers that will clear this whole uh, impression that not only the South African public have, or we have, uh, but also we have, about why Brian Malifi was paid, unpaid, resigned, retired, etc., etc. It will remain a comedy of errors and a riddle that we will not be able to answer today, but a full investigation will provide us the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just a few points. Uh, the first of which is when we talk about financial, uh, I think most of us have been around for a while, so we'll remember Enron. Pamela, the role of Arthur Anderson as the, one of the big four or five accounting firms uh, in, in the world at the time. And their financials looked pretty good until they started, started shredding paper, you see. So that's part of the history of financials in the world and of big entities that takes the public for a ride, uh, to put it uh, in a colloquial way. So. Numbers can speak all sorts of games or, or, or stories. And uh, I mean, Dr. Naidu is very proficient at, at pronouncing on some of those. But remember, there's the flip side as well. Clean audit reports, you know, we've seen them in municipalities, we've seen them in departments. But we know auditors and the public that's listening to this would want to know that auditors only uh, check a sample of transactions. And ultimately, that sample, uh, that hopefully is representative of what's going on. In the case of Eskom, regrettably, there's been a lot in the media, uh, regrettably from your point of view, fortunately from everybody else's point of view. Now, what's fascinating, Chairperson, is that I don't see any litigation against any media about the assertions made by various journalists, various uh, print and other media, very nice diagram showing, showing connections between all sorts of entities and people, flows of money, etc., etc. I mean, surely, as a board interested in good governance, we would be worried, is this true? Is there all this hundreds of millions actually flowing in the way that these diagrams actually suggest if Dr. Naidu and uh, Dr. Ngubane are so proficient in turn, as, as, as directors, why haven't they challenged us if this, these are lies? Otherwise, we have to accept them as the truth. And if that is the truth, then there's some serious questions. And, and I know well, part of the problem, Chairperson, is that we don't have the time to sit as a so-called commission on a full-time basis, nor the skills, uh, to actually go through this in detail. And that's why I repeatedly have said this morning, as have others, uh, and let me put it in a different way now, if there is a, such a thing as conscience, I think we're too late for that, by the way, 
But if there was such a thing as conscience that's operating, that we are handling a major public entity that it belongs to the public of South Africa, then maybe there's a, there's, there's a new option that's been opened since last Thursday, where the South African Council of Churches is saying, come and unburden yourself. Come and tell us in confidence. What is it that you've done to undermine public confidence? What is it that you've done that you don't want to declare because there might be legal and other implications? And the faith community is availing itself uh, to any employee, anybody in management, anybody anywhere, to come up and, and say, let's save our souls as a country. Because the world is watching us, Africa is watching us, and they're looking at, whilst we're praising, on the one hand, our entities, they're looking at how we are allowing those entities to decline in governance terms and in management terms and in delivery terms as well. Which then brings up the, the, the whole question of credit ratings. I mean, all three agencies have said over the last 18 months, as uh, Minister Brown knows, uh, and the Deputy Minister as well, that the governance and financial management in state-owned entities is one of their major concerns. And that when a body like ESCOM has guarantees of 350 billion runs, uh, and if there's default in any kind of way by them, by Sandral or others that are related, uh, that's serious consequences for the fiscal. <laughs> I don't want to go into that, but uh, I don't think credit rating is one of the plus factors that you want to claim for yourselves right now in terms of the sovereign. Uh, but we'll, we'll come back to the particularities in your case as well. Two last points, Chairperson. The first is I think we should call the CEO of the Eskom Pension Fund as well and, and hear he or she, what she, he or she has to say about some of the things that have been said to us. And the last point, as uh, our colleague Honorable Gungubele was saying earlier on, the minister, in fact, in the 2016 MOI has very significant powers assigned to herself, to hire and fire CEOs, to hire and fire members of the board, of course, with the Audi Alterum part-time rule being, being implemented. And the appeal I want to leave her with is that in the, in, the, in the public interest, perhaps some of those powers need to be exercised sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So when the minister made the first submission here, she said that I've instructed my legal team to draw my opposition to part A of the relief sought, and that I set aside my appointment of Mr. Mudifi. So I think that is the, the essence of it. I don't know, maybe she can speak deeper to that, that she's not opposing the relief sought by the court papers of both the DA and the EFF and other interested parties that the appointment of Brian will be set aside. Is that the clarity, Minister? Because it's not sought against me. It's not, it's not sought against me. It's sought against the board. Yes. No, that's fine. No, I, 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 I thought that they would deal with it in that particular context. I, I think that the important issue that we have to speak about much more clearly now is uh, the context to which uh, the Honorable Godan spoke about earlier of what are we dealing with here? We are dealing with a captured CEO of a state company called Prime Olive who works with a CEO called Mr. Singh, not Mr. Singh from the IF. Who <laughs> were when they were in transnet to the good co directorships in Gupta companies and brilliant capital. When both the CEO, Brian Mulifi, and CFO, Mr. Singh, went to ESCOM, 
Problem capital has got work from ESCOM. Like I've been receiving fees of hundreds of millions from ESCOM. That is common cause. No, no one can dispute that uh, in terms of uh, what has happened. This is a Gupta company, and uh, in the middle of that, together, resources, which is owned by the Guptas and Dozanizu, receives huge coal supply deals from ESCO. And as a matter of fact, was standing now with information that says that in a space of four months towards the conclusion of the together deal of coal supplies and trillion uh, ben benefiting from ESCO, Brian Mulefe was in Gupta's compound or house 19 times in a space of about five months. When Ajay Gupta was interviewed by public protector uh, Tulima Donse, he said, no, Brian is a very good friend of mine. He spent a lot of time with us in the house there. The companies act, the PFMA, the memorandum of understanding, and all the basic directives that give guidance on the ethics that must guide directors of companies prohibit a situation where friends benefit or business partners, friends benefit out of the activities of those particular board members. That is the issue at, at, at point now. That is the context that must be providing at all times in terms of uh, what we should do. I agree that we should demand from ESCOM all the minutes that the, the uh, Minister uh, Gordon spoke about, but also we should ask as to how many deals did Trillion Capital receive from ESCOM and how many deals did together receive and at, at what value and what was the process that was followed in terms of uh, what has happened now. I can tell you today that and we know all of us, we're just maybe trying to tip two around it, that the reason why Brian is imposed back to ESCO is because the Guptas want to continue to loot ESCO. He was brought to parliament because, as the Communist Party says, there was an attempt to make him a minister of finance. It's a, it's a common fact. It's a fact that we cannot dispute. And when the attempt to make him a minister of finance to continue with what the South African Council of, Church, uh, 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 of Churches called the Mafia State, when that attempt failed, then he was then imposed back to ESCOM to continue the looting project. Okay. And then we must fold our arms and, and, and act as if we do not know. We must be drawn into some blindness. And, uh, and when, when wrongful things are happening currently, I think that we need to provide decisive leadership and stop this pure nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. That is what we are dealing with here of a nonsensical family called of Guptas who come here to loot our resources by zombifying uh, people who otherwise were going to be good executives in their own right. That is what we're dealing with, of an extremely corrupt family who use money to buy politicians and who, who unfortunately control the president of the ANC. To, to instruct people to do wrong things. And then we must now go and waste time in the court processes, whose conclusions are quite obvious in terms of what is going to happen. I don't think that we should be running around in this particular format. Let's give an instruction. Maybe we can do that, Chair. There's a committee that the minister must not oppose anything that has been sought in court and as, a, as the memorandum, memorandum of understanding gives it the powers, there must not be opposition as well from the ESCOM board. Uh, the appointment of Brian Molefe must be reversed and then we must then deal thoroughly with the issues that relate to some of the deals that have been signed under uh, Brian Molefe and the C CFO who were deployed there by the Guptas to loot the ESCOM for their own purposes. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members.
Honorable members, I just want to remind you that this is a process that we have started. We are still going to continue with the process until we, 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 we are satisfied. I think also, I am not sure if I've heard ESCOM correctly in the past. It looks like ESCOM, you will correct me on the members, and even ESCOM will correct me, is saying the findings of the public protector are not binding. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, I, I do want to just say something to the Honourable Member Singh. There will never be a situation we came, we saw, we conquered. Oh, my mic's not on. We came, we saw, we conquered. Please never see that. Because I don't take for granted the democratic institutions that have been set up in this country to hold us accountable and for checks and balances. I would like to respond to Honorable Member Mazzoni. Not for one minute will I not appear before a, a portfolio committee. If it's not on a Wednesday, you, the portfolio committee meets on a Wednesday and it's very difficult for me because it's also cabinet day. But the, the issue for me is that the portfolio committees Direction is an incredibly important one. But I have to say to the Honourable Member Shivambo that you can't reasonably or democratically instruct me to not do this or not do that in terms of the court. I have taken a decision that I will not oppose A of the court proceedings and I'll take A review of what I need to do on B. And I mean, I, that I've done with legal um, instruction. Let me start by speaking about the MOI, because I think this is very important. And now I am going to quote from my affidavit. You are quoting from a 2016 MOI. Let me just repeat. I speak about a 2016 MOI, and I speak about a 2014 MOI. MRIs are dynamic documents. You can change them in two years, in three years. You change them as you change the significance and materiality document. That's how you change them. So in 2014, and now I'm quoting from my affidavit, because I'm quoting so that you get it absolutely right. The 2014 MRI did not require the minister to be noted the 2014 MOI, remember I was appointed in May 2014, did not require the minister be, to be noted as a party to the employment agreement of the group's chief executive officer. Paragraph 14.3.4 of 2016 MOI requires the minister, <coughs> the MOI 2016 is the one that I've changed 
that because there were so little powers in the 2014 MOI, I changed it in 2016 to give me the powers that the Honourable Member Mondley reads out and the Honourable Member Gordon reads out. That's where I changed the... the uh, just check, you've got a 2016 and a 2014 one. So, so the issue is, and this is where the court has to rule, on the 7th of March 2016, Mr. Mulefi and Dr. Ngubani, in his capacity as chair of ESCOM's board, concluded an executive employment contract, um, and this was some three months before the adoption of the 2016 MOI. So that is, look, I hold a view on it. The 2014 um, um, MOI that ESCOM says that it has appointed um, are two different MOIs. They're not the same. They're not of one MOI. But, but is that, can, can, you, can you clear the fact that which MOI is at work now? Is it both Today. of them or is it 2016? No, 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 no. To, the MOI for 2016 was passed, I think, in July 2016. So at the moment, as you and I speak, it's July 2016's MOI. Just a point, I'm not going to end up the debate. If you go to 13 point, 13 point, uh, 13 point, 3 point 2, of 2014, 2014, 2014, up the appointment of the Chief Executive Officer and the RT, it says the shareholder shall appoint the CE from the shortlist of the candidates provided by the board. <coughs> Which class? Which two clause are you talking about? 14 points? Yeah, which class? So. Yeah. Yeah. Do you respond to it? I'll just let Matsi respond to it. But I mean, that's what I have in my affidavit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not, thanks, Honorable Member. The, the provision of the old MOI clause that you're reading, 13.1, the distinction between that and the 2016 one relates to two things the appointment and the contract. Both of them are consistent in terms of the, uh, the, the, the appointment process, but the inconsistency in the 2014 MOI is the issue of the contract. The 2014 MOI does not require the minister to know to that contract. Minister participates in the appointment process, um, the board undertakes a, a recruitment, and then they note to, to the minister, minister notes it to cabinet. But the 2016, the difference is that now minister becomes a party to the, to the contract. So that's the distinction between the two. So irrespective. That is misleading. That is misleading. Anyway, we let the court if, 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 judge if, if, this. If you agree, sorry, I'm not checking, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. If you agree, if this 2014 says the minister appoints, it doesn't make sense to say the minister has got no interest in the contract. If the minister finally decides who is appointed, okay. it means the minister consistently will be the one to fire. So on, on the basis of what he has, she has not noted. So there's something seriously inconsistent. Can, can Matt say this one? Uh, Matt, yes, thanks. Not, not necessarily. The, the case in point now of the reappointment, if you look at the two MOIs, they talk to the appointment process. They are consistent on the appointment process. The inconsistency, which has been clarified in the 2016 MOI, is the contracting. The minister is now a party to that contract. But there's consistency, and you're right, honorable member. Minister participates in the appointment process, even in the 2014. So you're correct on that. Yes. In both of them, she appoints. Yes. 
but she, she, in the 2016, it's because <laughs> it is now a party to the contract as well. Thank you. Give over to the minister to, to, to continue. Look, what, what also needs to happen, these things are, the way it's written is also complicated for me. Because 2014's um, MRI is not as clear as I think 2016's MRI, and that's the one I have a hand in. I don't have a hand in the 2014 MRI. This is what I inherited. Um, having said that, I, I thought I should also talk to um, the issue of what processes are in place to fix the problems now. I think all the other matters are opinions, but I mean, what processes are in place to fix the matters now? Look, there are a number of processes. When the issue of um, the number of people who were connected to a particular family came about, we, start a review, we started a, review, a different review process where Every six months, as opposed to an annual review of conflicts of interest, we do it every six months now. So in the process, I think um, not related to this necessarily, because I don't know what the reasons were, um, other than um, personal, four members of ESCOM's board resigned. So, so that's happened because of a different process of governance that we're trying to install. <coughs> The, the second issue is that we've also started a, a, um, a process where it's not, it's not there yet, but we, we have um, the CEO appointments in the public sector. They are slightly different than appointments made in the private sector. So for us in the public sector, cabinet approval is also required Required for appointments of CEO, especially for those entities that are major public entities in terms of Schedule 2 of the PFMA. So, so that's also something that we are, are, are looking at. And that is something to give greater clarity for us just working with the documentation in relation to the MOIs. Um, we, after this, we hope we don't speak about the 24, not today, but after this process that goes to court and the court rules on it, then we hope we don't have to speak about the 2014 MRI, but we strengthen and speak to the 2016 MRI. The other issue is also external evaluations of board members. Now, normally it's an internal in evaluation of board members, and in the last two years we've had external evaluations of board members. And the idea there is to give the minister an opportunity before the AGM um, to be able to rotate members if, if needs be. Um, and so ESCOM's AGM, as I said, is at the end of June, beginning of July, some, sometime. And that process is underway already. But more importantly, there is a systemic problem here. And I'm going back to the SOC reform, and it's not going to happen in this year. I mean, we're not going to have all the ministers having commented, the public at large having commented on the shareholder management bill. It is, but there's a systemic problem in the state managing the state-owned companies. Because with a public sector mind, managing a commercial, commercially driven <coughs> developmental um, company that belongs to the state is something that we've got to fix in terms of the state-owned company reform process. And that's what I'm hoping will take away the kind of fragmentation, the looseness in the relationship between the shareholder representative, because the, the state remains the shareholder representative, and the state-owned companies. And, and I think this, you don't see it immediately, but you see it eventually um, in terms of the management of state-owned companies. 
The state-owned companies find it very hard to report to a sector unit, for example, um, because they are busy doing what they do commercially. And they put, chase profits, they chase sustainability, they chase other things. And we are saying they are state-owned companies and they have, to, they have what is um, called a developmental agenda as well. Um, so that, that deals with the issue of um, state-owned companies. I, I'm still hoping that in, a, in putting together, um, when I do my sp budget speech on Thursday, which is supposed to be a surprise, this part, that I will have the investigation into the procure procurement matters in ESCOM. And that whilst I don't think, I mean, I think there's a lot of opinion in the room. We don't all hold the same opinion. I don't hold the same opinion. And I think, thank God, we live in a democracy and we can hold our own opinions about various things. But I would like to see that the state-owned companies um, perform more optimally than what they are doing now. In fact, the, I mean, I don't see Mr. Gordon here at the moment, but the, the good the thing is, we've just come, the DM and I have just come from the credit rating agencies. Now, as much as the Honourable Member Maundley doesn't care about whether we are financially sustainable or not, I care that we're financially sustainable. We are governance, we, are, we have good governance and strong governance. Those are important issues for us. And that, that is what's important for the credit rating agencies too. Matter of opinion? But, but it's a matter of opinion, isn't it? I've had, there have been lots of misrepresentations. I have to take it. You've got to be strong. <laughs> be strong, honorable member. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm sorry if it's a misrepresentation, then I'm very sorry. Um, but I would like to say the other one to be strong. Um, but, you know, ESCOM does have the highest government guarantee in this country. 350 billion rands, um, Honorable Member Gordon is right. They've drawn down 200 billion rand. I put a challenge to them. I won't be here, but I put the challenge to them anyway that they reduce their guarantee over the next five years so that they are not the best. And in 20 years, they've never defaulted. And I didn't say this, but the credit rating agencies told us that the one thing about the company is that it hasn't defaulted on its credit rating in 20 years. And so to the board, I don't think they should get to that position. And I don't think we will be in that position at this point. But I've heard all the comments that members have made We'll take it into con to to cognizance as we the chair guides us in what the next move will be and the next move in terms of what we, are, we should do. And we do subject ourselves to um, parliamentary scrutiny. Um, <coughs> I, I don't think that that is without saying. We go, all of us, the DA has taken us to court, the EFF is an enjoiner there, and we will all be in court on the 30th of May, and maybe by then some of these other things will be a little bit more, bit clearer. Um, so on behalf of myself and my team, and ESCOM, we thank you very much for the meeting. Oh, thank you, Minister. The DM has raised his, his hand. Oh. Don't forget the DM. And then after the, the, the DM will have a closing remark, after the closing remark will release the, 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 the department, the, 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 the ministry, and we leave just for 10 minutes as a committee to look at our recommendations and our, uh, what, what do we do? What, how do we take this forward? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Members of the Portfolio Committee have obviously raised a number of uh, pertinent issues. The one I'd like to comment on uh, is an issue that the Minister just raised in regard to procurement. 
And one of the issues that have been raised in regard to the procurement of coal at ESCOM has been a company that was uh, named Together, a company that's closely associated with uh, the name of the Gupta family. There are certain issues that uh, the department can do, investigations that the department can carry out. I have discussed the issue with the minister, and uh, the minister has agreed with me that as a matter of urgency, it is important to lift the veil in regard to procurement around the coal issue so that it can be clear to everyone what's the remit and scope of all the contractors that have received contracts from ESCOM to provide coal. That information as a matter of agency needs to be brought to the fore so that uh, all the companies concerned can be identified. The period, the scope, the number of years that they've been provided with those contracts. And then if there are a number of black companies there, we need to know all the companies, irrespective of uh, family associations. If there are white companies, which are those white companies? If there are black companies, which are those companies? So that there's transparency in regard to. I mentioned this as but one example of investigations that are within the power and remit that the department and the ministry can carry out. By doing that, there will be clearer information and transparency that uh, we have a responsibility to the public to provide the necessary information where we do have the information. Thank you, Jim. Sure. Thank you, Deputy Minister, and thank you for the presentation that we But the Minister has spoken. I don't think there is anybody who has, who has, who, who can speak. Uh, I'll close the meeting by saying the committee is concerned with the state of government at the storm. There seems to be a breakdown in communication between shareholder and the state owned company. The committee is concerned with the breakdown of corporate governance principles at ESCOM. In this regard, the committee views the reappointment of Mr. Mulitu with serious concern. In fact, the committee see the reappointment as an illegal, as an illegal, uh, illegal thing that happened in ESCOM until the committee is convinced otherwise. As we are saying, we are going to continue doing, uh, continue with this process that we have started. We also, as a committee, support the decision for a parliamentary inquiry in line with NA rules to look into the board of ESCOM. We will further seek advice on how to deal with the decision of reappointment of the chief executive. We further require ESCOM to provide the committee with the documents that have been, um, uh, documents that we uh, were raised here by the committee members, the correspondence, the decision taken to reappoint Mr. Mulefe, and other necessary documents that you think will help us going forward in this, uh, in, in, in this committee. And in fact, helping you as ESCOM and helping every other uh, entity that is in our committee to, to, to develop the, the country as per their mandate. I, 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 I wish you well in whatever you are going to do after this committee and bring us more information on the reappointment of... We are not convinced. I don't want to lie to you. We are not convinced as the committee. Maybe if you give us some other information, not the one that you have given us, I, am, I, I see that the committee is not convinced. So thank you very much. Uh, the committee will remain just for 10 minutes and just look at our recommendations and take a way forward. Thank you very much. I don't want to say the meeting is adjourned. This session is adjourned. Sorry, Chief, just one quick question. Um, is it an inquiry into the board?
what in particular the poem is. That, that's what the poem is. Yes, I mean, I just, just, just from, I have to send it off onto the wires now. But, just, but we're still going to okay. discuss it as oh, a comedy. Okay. Sorry, ma'am. <laughs> yes? Yeah? Can I go to the loop? Quickly. Ah. Um, you know, we are the way you are going to run. Put hand on the ass, put him on the ass, let me see that. Put hand on the ass, let me see that. Put hand on the ass, Can we start the meeting members, please? After this meeting members, we are invited for lunch. Yo. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Let's 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 be quick. 
No, basically, it's the way of the closing. Have I represented you well in 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 my final uh, summary. summary? Is it is it right? Wow. Uh, is there anything? Is there anything that you want to add on what I have said? On, on the recommendation, the time, the time frame, the, give us the time frame, members, for all these things that are happening. The documents, when they must The be documents, when must, must, must they be submitted? When do we, uh, how do we start the, the inquiry uh, and everything else? Honorable. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I propose that this process should have started within a period of 14 days. Okay. Honorable Mazzone, Honorable Singh. Yeah, the Chairperson and I agree that all the documents, but I think what would be also important is the outcome of the that is the mayor, in mm. terms of one, one issue. Yeah. But we need to write to the office and speak. I, 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 we would need to add a committee. Mm -hmm. They've come back to say that you can't investigate Mr. Wallifis because he wasn't appointed by Parliament. But they're suggesting an amendment to the resolution. But we can drop that in our committee but we need resources. Yeah. So the what? office of the speaker has to bring us more legal people, research people. Uh, we must invite people to come. Because, you know, there are a lot of people out there who will say a lot of things about these contracts and all that. We do, do, do we first apply for, 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 for doing the inquiry? Yeah. So that we get all the, what, when in our application we, 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 we put everything that we, we will need for the inquiry. And we do the terms of yeah, no, no, I, I just want to make a point on a yeah. say yeah. that there's no one who should tell us who, who tell us who to investigate. We may decide we, we, we've got no power to decide who to appoint or not to appoint. Yeah. But the circumstances of his appointment were entitled to investigate those. So. The, then 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 it means the program of the committee will change members. Yeah. That you must yeah, that was, must take into consideration on Honorable Mazel. So they must start now submitting those documents to us that we have those in 14 days. And then we must push for a 21 day, that's, that's more than fair enough, three week period for the criminal investigation to start. Okay. We will give them 14 days, but we don't go beyond 21 days. Uh, Honorable uh, Stianezen. Chairperson, thank you very much. At the outset, let me just uh, express a vote of thanks to you, Madam Chair, for the way you've managed this meeting. I think it's thank you. one of the best meetings I've had. Thank you very much. Thank you. I of course pay the amount. I think that the committee is also going to, the members of the committee, are going to supply their minds about who gets subpoenaed to appear in the next Yes, in the next meeting. The story will only emerge once the right people are called before you. And so we must consider calling you know, people in the Victor family, people that are from Tegeta, etc., to be able to, and people from within the institute as well. Yeah. Can you agree that we are going to get a thorough legal advice on the entire on the process? Entire process that we leave it there. And, yeah. and the scope, and yes. The scope of the, of the yeah. I think we are done. Thank you. Thank and you I, I, the meeting is adjourned. Can we go to lunch just for five minutes, take well, lunch, and then. You know what that item is very important. Uh, uh, I'll right. do everything and then we'll send them a proposal. Yes. 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 This is the scope of what you want to do. Yes. 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 How do you properly spell your surname? I've seen it with an H, I've seen it without an H. It's an H. It's an A T H. No, no, no. R A N N for November. R A N T H O. Thank you. Ranto. No, the, the inquiry is only going to be on the in the reappointment of Brian okay. Mollif and the processes to the reappointment okay. of Brian Mollif. Um, with Mr. Stianazen's uh, suggestion now in terms of subpoenas, he said even subpoena uh, members of the Gupta family and Ope, would you be open to that, subpoena anyone to this committee? We will subpoena an, anyone in this committee, but 
we are also subjected to the legal advice that we are going to get. So the legal advice will tell us if it is correct for the committee to subpoena even the Guptas, the Tegeta people, and anybody that you think needs to come to the to, to, to the committee. But, that, but that's only committee. in relation to the reappointment of Mr. It's, Malefe. It's, it's not to investigate other matters related to no, ESCOM. No, it's not. It's going to be only in the in, to be investigated the reappointment of Brian Malefe. The process is towards the reappointment of Brian Malefe. Because the committee that is, is, is very much concerned with the process that has taken place. But there were also proposals that you should look into the broader issues uh, regarding procurement at ESCO. What's uh, the decision there? The, the, the decision is, we, we, we said we are starting a process. Uh -huh. So we will start this process, going to the inquiry as a committee, and every other process that comes out, out of that inquiry, we will continue uh, with it. Okay. Yeah. So just on that note, if you can just tell us in short what's the process from here on going forward. The, as the committee have already said that we are going to have an inquiry as a committee and then we will also, the, the, the ESCOM people and the department must give us all the documentations. Then from those documentations what we get from them and then the process will take, will, will take place. But then this matter is before the court and uh, <coughs> I think the court is here in this, uh, on, on Tuesday next week. What if the court then decides that the, to set aside this, uh, this, this, this appointment, your inquiry then becomes moved? But, but that does not uh, stop us as a committee of parliament in our processes. We will do our processes as a committee. Whatever the court comes up with, we will do our processes. We will not stop because we are an oversight a, a body of parliament. Would this inquiry be coming through the Public Enterprises PC, or would you think that a, a motion to set up an ad hoc committee would, would better service getting to the bottom of this issue? I think we ha uh, a certain party did apply for an ad hoc committee, which it, it, which, uh, it, it, it got a, an answer in saying there's no need for an ad hoc committee. We've got all the powers to do the inquiry as the, committee, as the portfolio committee. Of public so enterprises. your next step is wait, giving the 14 days. For yes, yeah. we we'll wait to for the, the 14 days to, for them to provide us the, the documents, and we're not giving them beyond 21 days. Yes, thank you. And thank just you. to add to the chair, the inquiry is not about Brian Malifi only. Mm -hmm. The inquiry that we want to institute as a committee, it goes beyond. beyond it will go as as I am saying. The, pro the processes not about have just started. Brian we will will so go that's on. Why there's no moot. Whatever no moot. comes out of the no inquiry, no we will. Yeah persuade it until we get to the end of the story. But the starting point but is... The starting point is, is the, the inquiry of on Brian Mulefe's reappointment. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you very much.